Adventures in Time and Space Told in Future Tense Dimension X Can you predict what will come in 100 years? Or in 10? Or in the next minute? Some people think they can. Nuclear scientists, mathematicians, astronomers, biologists. They'll predict the shape of the future. Why? Because they make the future. Because they see beyond the known dimensions of time and space. Into the unknown. Dimension X. We go ahead now in time to 1965. We're on a vast concrete runway set in the desert of the southwest. A giant metal ship stands before us, prow pointed for the stars. And in five minutes, the signal will flash and it will tear up through the atmosphere to the outer limit. Attention. Attention. Five minutes, Steve. Or right. take off. Wire her up, Charlie. Turn her over. I want to go over procedure again, Steve. Don't no worry, I got it straight. You just make sure. Okay. I take her up on jets to 50,000, then I cut in the rockets. No lower, or your tail blast will burn out three counties. I climb four minutes on rockets, then start maneuver tests. Remember that, no more than four minutes. Right. This ship isn't like those strato rockets you've been testing. She's the first one built for outer space. If she works, she can go clear to the moon. I'd have known that, I'd have brought my toothbrush. Well, not this trip. Now, get this, Steve. You've got power there to clear the Earth's gravitational field. But remember, after you cut in the rockets, you've only got ten minutes fuel. If you go beyond the outer limit and don't save fuel for the return... I know, I won't get down again. That's right, Steve. You'll drift off into space. Get that now. Ten minutes fuel. Gotcha. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this project is a lot more important than that cosmic ray bomb they're testing out in the Pacific tonight. Well, Security Commission brass doesn't think so. I don't see any undersecretaries under anything. Don't worry. In the long run, our ship will make the CR bomb back page stuff. But in the meantime, it's just as dangerous. Remember, half the principles in this ship are pure theory, Steve. Slide rule stuff. If anything goes wrong, we may have to scrape you off the landscape with a soup spoon. You have a charming sense of humor. Well, here's what I'm getting at. We're risking your neck in this test. If anything blows, we don't want to have the next man pull the same boner. I know, Hank. So keep your mic open and keep talking. If anything goes wrong, we want to know exactly why. And we won't be able to ask you. Let us know before you pull every switch. Before you do anything. You got that? Yeah. Even if you only have to blow your nose. All right, get those fuel lines away. Okay, Mr. Bro. Well, I guess that's about all, Steve. Yeah, that reminds me. Look, if Mary calls, I'm just up on a milk run. I didn't tell her today was it. How is she? She's okay, but she's due about now, and I don't want her to be nervous. Hey, I didn't know the baby was that close. Yeah. Steve, I, I really ought to be sending a single man on this job. What, and cut me out of a soft paycheck? Forget it, Hank. You know, you can't get anybody else who can take 15 G's acceleration when those rockets cut in. Yeah, I know. It's time, Steve. Yeah. Well, see you later. Don't worry, Hank. I'll sweat for both of us. Button her up, Shelly. So long, Hank. So long. We'll give you the light from control. Extra war to control. Extra war to control. Are you there yet, Hank? Okay, Steve. Got you on the speaker. I'm ready to go. Mr. Hanson. Ready on radar, Sergeant? Jack. Mr. Hanson, you better see this. What is it, Elsa? Message center for Steve. Mrs. Weston just left for the hospital. What? Hello, Steve. Yeah. Stand by a minute. Shall we hold the takeoff, Mr. Hanson? What? Oh, yes. Uh, no, wait, wait just a minute. It's uh, it's too late now. You going to tell him? Maybe he's got enough to worry about. Hey, what's holding us up, Hank? Something on your mind? No, no, it's, uh, it's nothing, Steve. I just wanted to say good luck. Clear for takeoff, Charlie? Right. Okay. Give him the light. All right, 
charge, Steve. I'm reading you clear. I'm at 40,000. Airspeed 600. She's running fine. The soundproofing works. There's a third degree waiver in the AGY pressure. Got that, Charlie? Check. Uh, dead center on radar, Mr. Hanson. 50,000 now. Cutting out the port jet. Now the starboard. I'm off jets. Airspeed dropping. Opening the rocket ports. Switch sticks a little, Charlie. Oxy alcohol pressure 350. All right, now I'm advancing the ignition key. Here goes rocket one. Steve. Steve, you all right? Yeah. Feels like somebody slugged me with a sledgehammer. Airspeed now 1200. Here goes number two. <laughs> Hello, Steve. Elapsed rocket time is now four minutes. What's your altitude? Over to you. Speed 4400, still climbing. Altitude, 297 miles. All right, you're at the outer limit. Level off for maneuver test. You've got exactly six minutes fuel left. Okay. Starting a three degree left bank. She's a little sluggish. There, it's all right now. There's a low vibration someplace. Maybe the cockpit hatch. Now I'm straightening out. Five minutes fuel left. Now I'm starting a three degree ru- Hey! What's the matter? What's wrong? There's something up here. Something shining. What are you talking about? There's something above me, Hank. I'm going to chase it. Steve! Steve, you're at the outer limit now. I can see it plain now. Steve, don't go any higher. You've only got four minutes left. You've only got... I'm getting static. I can't hear you, Hank. It's dead ahead now. I'm going to make a pass at it. Get a good look. Hey, it's swerving to meet me. It's dead ahead now. It's dead ahead. Hello. Hello. Hello, Steve. Steve, come in. Nine minutes fuel gone. Still no sign on radar. Hello. Hello, Steve. Steve, what's happened? Charlie, get out the crash squad. Tell the Army squadron to alert their search planes. Right. Nine and a half minutes gone. Hello. Hello, Steve. What's happened? What the devil is it? Charlie, come in, Mr. Hanson. Come in, Steve. We need a search squadron. Come in. No, Mr. Hanson's busy. Hello. Hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. Ten minutes, Mr. Hanson. It's the end of this fuel. How long has it been now? Ten hours, Mr. Hanson. Nothing more on radar, Sergeant? Screen's blank. Colonel Corelli called in. Search planes are back. He didn't find anything. Should be some trace. He couldn't have bailed out, could he? You don't hit the silk at 4,400 miles an hour. Either went past the outer limit, ran out of fuel. Something blew and we'll find the pieces scattered from here to the coast. Why does it have to be the best man? Always the best man. I'll get it. Charlie, yes, Charlie, we, you know, we've got to That's figure right. out what was wrong. Yes. All right, I'll tell you. Something, something right. must have blown. Right? Yeah. There's a message from Northside Hospital for, for Steve. Well, what is it? Mrs. Weston's fine. It's a boy. Thank you, Elsie. It's a boy, Charlie. Oh. Fine. Fine. It's a boy. He didn't even know she went to the hospital. How am I going to tell Mary that? Wasn't your fault, Mr. Hanson? Ship had to be tested. Yeah, yeah, we'll build another one, and some other flying fool will shoot past the outer limit into space. Oh, I'm getting old, Charlie. You can remember when I used to take him up myself. Now I've got to send other men. It's a job, Mr. Hanson. Now I'm afraid. Every time I hear a jet go off, I jump. Every time I have to send someone up in a new model, I start to sweat. Mr. Hanson. Yeah? I think there's something on the radar. No flights scheduled in either, Elsie. We have the whole day cleared. It's coming in behind us. Here it comes over the building. 
What crazy jock is buzzing the field like that? Is that an army plane, Charlie? I can't see. It's turning. Charlie, alert the field. I know that engine. It's Steve. That's impossible. Look, that's his ship. It can't be. There was no other model like that. It's Steve, all right. It's coming in. Thank God. Thank God. All right, sit down, Steve. The quicker we get this done, the quicker you get over to see Mary and the baby. Hank. Elsie, give the order to check and refuel the rockets. I don't want anybody in here till I get Steve's reports. Bury any calls. All right, let's have it. What the devil happened to you? Hank, does that cosmic ray bomb still go off tonight? What are you talking about? Straighten out, Steve. Where have you been for the last ten hours? Listen, Hank, there's something more I'm... Come on, come on, I've got to get a report on the screen to Washington, so let's have it. I've got to know how you stretch ten minutes fuel to keep you in the air for ten hours. Now, one thing before I talk... Look, Steve... Have the Geiger men run over the ship before they refuel. What'd you run into? So help me, Hank, I don't know. We better check and make sure it isn't radioactive. Elsie, add a Geiger report on the standard check. Steve, maybe we better have the doc look you over, too. No, no, I'll be all right. They said I'd be all right. They? Look, son, I know you've had a tough time, but we've had this field on the alert for ten hours. One of the army boys cracked up looking for you, and he's hurt bad. So let's have the story. Let's have it straight. (laughs) I don't know how to tell you. Hank. I saw something up there. At 300 miles? I chased something up there, Hank, and I caught it. Now, don't hand me that, Listen, Steve. I was cruising along, just starting the right bank, when I spotted something. It must have been going about half my speed. It was egg-shaped and smooth. I made a pass at it, and I was coming back for another, and then there was a humming sound. Humming? A sort of vibration, and I blacked out. I was headed straight for it at 4,400 miles an hour. I thought it was going to be the biggest smash since Hiroshima, and... Hank, is there a drink in that bottle? Never mind that, Steve. What happened? I came to inside their ship. Uh Uh-huh. Steve, this whole thing has been a devil of a strain on you. I'm going to call Major Donaldson from the Army base. Ask him to sit in. Psychiatrist? Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Let him run his test. He'll tell you I'm not kidding. Because, Hank, unless I miss my guess... I've just been tipped off to the way the world ends. All right, Mr. Weston, suppose you continue your story. Yes, let's have it, Steve. You woke up inside the ship? Yes, and uh, the place was jammed with machinery. Hmm. Dials, blinkers. I couldn't recognize anything. And you were surrounded by these men from Mars? I didn't say anything about men from Mars. I didn't even say they were men. I couldn't see them clearly. They they were just there. Where did they come from then? Another galaxy. Millions of miles outside of our solar system. That's all I know. You figure out where they came from. And they came all that distance to find the Earth? Yes. Did they tell you that? Yes. You mean they spoke English to you? No, no, they didn't. That's funny. I hadn't thought... They didn't really speak to me at all. They just planted the thoughts in my mind. You mean thought transference, telepathy? Yes, that's right. Well, Steve, what brought them here? We did, Hank. We rang their bell. We brought them in. How? With our atomic explosions. Hank, that's why you've got to stop that bomb test tonight. Uh, I'll give up. Look, you've got to believe me, Hank. Oh, how can I make you understand? Maybe I can help, Mr. West. Would you submit to narco-psychometry... What's that? Under proper drugs, I can put you back in this, uh, ship. By suggestion. Then we can get a playback record of your memory pattern on the audio circuit. And how long will that take? Half an hour. We'll have to go over to the lab. Will you believe me if it checks? It will give us an accurate memory picture of what your mind reports. All right, let's go. Hank, you gotta believe me, we haven't got much time. <laughs> You should be getting drowsy now. 
count backwards from ten. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Six. He's under. Now we attach the head plate electrodes. The cortical pickup. Look out for that wire, Mr. Hudson. 3-0 setting, 31.3. Now throw that switch, Mr. Hanson. I have to start him off by suggestion. All right, Steve. You're in your ship now. You're in the rocket. Rocket. You're in the rocket. You're in the rocket. And you've just sighted something strange. Now I'm starting at three degree right. What's that? Hey, there's something up here. Something shining. His memory pattern. We're picking it up electronically. There's something above me, Hank. I'm going to chase it. It's piped through the audio circuits. I'm getting static. I can't hear you, Hank. This is where we lost contact with him. I'm going to make a pass at it and... Hey, it's swerving to meet me. It's not ahead now. It's not ahead. Now, boss. This is where he blacked out. There's no telling how long, minutes or hours. What's that noise? I don't know, quiet. Where? How did I get in here? What? Who are you? Is he seeing things? Intergalactic patrol. What's that? What are they saying, Steve? What are they saying? It's about nuclear fission. They know about it. They know the danger of it. Long ago, they had wars that almost destroyed them. But finally, they learned. Now they've outlawed war. Go on, Steve. They patrol space. When their detector picks up an atomic explosion, they send a patrol. What are they going to do? They've quarantined us. Quarantined? They've isolated the Earth. Because we don't know how to control ourselves yet. Until we learn, we'll be a menace to the whole universe. What is this nonsense? How are they going to do it, Steve? They've spread a layer out here of... I don't know how to call it. All around the Earth. It's miles deep. When there's an atomic explosion on Earth, the radioactive particles will drift up to this layer and set off a chain reaction. It'll go around the world in microseconds. And that's the end. The end? What's he doing? Wait, wait. Yes. Yes. I understand. I've got to bring back the warning. You're going to put me back in my ship to bring the warning. Now what? Blacked out again. I guess that's all. What does all that mean? It's what he remembers. Don't think that really happened. No, no. Narcosachometry circuits produce what he remembers. It just means that Steve believes this happened. I don't uh, like to see this. Uh, I've seen too many top uh, pilots snap. Steve is the best I've known. Mm -hmm. How bad do you think he is? Frankly, outside of the presence of this well-organized hallucination, there's no sign of unbalance. It may not be too serious. If he had a more plausible story, I'd be inclined to believe Warning. him. Warning. Warning. Hank. It's all right, boy. Did you hear it, Hank? You understand? Sure, sure. We've, we've been quarantined. Now let me give you something to make you sleep, Steve. But don't you understand? They fixed it so that if we set off one more nuclear explosion, that'll be it. Of course. Don't roll your sleep down. You don't believe me. Now, take it easy, Steve. But the test tonight. They're setting off the CR bomb. Hank, what time is it? 11.20. Well, it's scheduled for midnight. I think we got to stop that bomb. Steve, let Donaldson give you the hypo. Thank you've got to believe me. I saw them. I got the warning. If we touch off that bomb tonight, it'll be the biggest galactic 4th of July of all time. The whole earth will go up like a Roman candle. April 10th, 1965, the end. Now, look, Steve, you better calm down. Don't you want to see Mary and the baby? You've got a new son, remember? Yeah, that's just it. I, I want to see my son. I want him to live. If that bomb goes off, 
Hank, we've got to stop them. Mr. Hanson, I think we'd better get over to the base hospital. Hank, you've got to believe me. Yeah, they... sure, sure, Steve. Maybe there is something to it. Look, it's out of your hands. I'll put it in a report and shove it into Washington in the morning. In the morning? There isn't going to be any morning, Hank. Don't you understand? You've got to call Washington now. Get the head of the security commission and postpone that test. Now, you know I can't do that, Steve. My neck would be out a mile. Besides, this is 1965, not 45. Twenty countries have atomic bombs now. What's the use of stopping just this one? The rest will keep right on popping them. Well, then we'll have to call an international conference. Can't you understand, Hank? The first one that goes off finishes us at the end. They've given us the quarantine warning. Steve, I think you'd better go with us to the base hospital. <laughs> Look, Steve. We can call up for a detail if we have to. All right, all right. I'll go with you. You don't need a straight jacket. That's the way, Steve. You'll probably feel better by morning. Let's go. Well, Steve, tomorrow I'll drive you over to the hospital to see Mary and the kid. Sure. Look at the ship under the floodlights. Pretty, huh? You'll be flying her again soon, don't you worry. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, what you doing out in the line? The, uh, refueler? Yeah, we've got Clausewitz coming in tomorrow from Denver for another test. I figure we give you a day off. That's good. That's fine. Steve! Steve, come back! Come on, Donaldson. Steve! Steve, wait! He's heading for the rocket! Look, there he goes up! That crazy fool! We can't get at him now. That covers armor glass. He's waving. Yeah, towards control. It's the radio. He means the radio. Come on. I should have gotten help. Oh, the radio's still hooked up here. Hello. Hello, Steve. Listen to me, Hank. You gotta call Washington now. Come out of that rocket, Steve. I'll call my men. Don't Hanson. try anything, Hank. They refueled the rocket for tomorrow. Take it easy, Steve. Listen, you know what'll happen when I fire the rocket tubes down here? Steve, don't. It'll burn out every building for five miles. All of us in one big flash. Steve, what do you want? You've got to stop that bomb. you got to call Washington right now. They won't believe me. You make that call or I cut in the rocket. Now, I mean it, Hank. Now, hook my screen to yours in parallel. I want to see exactly what you're doing. All right, all right. Just don't fire those rockets. Get going, Hank. you got 12 minutes to make that call and stop that bomb. All right, I'm making the parallel hookup right now. Donaldson, you think he'll really blast? I don't know. Up to now, I'd almost say it was normal, but now he's liable to do anything, Hanson. Steve, Steve, there, are you getting it on your screen? Yeah. Now, put that call through. All right. Operator. Visit screen to Washington. The visit screen circuits are busy, sir. If you'll try again in half an hour. This is security commission priority. Break in, get me a line. Yes, sir. Just a moment, please. Ten minutes, Hank. Listen, Steve, I'm trying. We're ready to take your call, sir. Uh, Washington, security commission three. This is urgent. I want Undersecretary Herbert Ames. Washington, three. One moment, please. Hurry, will you? One moment, please. What time is it, Donaldson? 11.51. Do you think you'll fire those rockets? She might. Washington? Business screen three. Mr. Herbert Ames, please. That is a coded exchange. I cannot accept your call without clearance. Get it through, Hank! Listen, Washington, put it through. This is Mr. Hanson at San Marco Air Base. This is a priority call. I'm coded. One moment, please. I will check your code number. Get that through, Hank, and that bomb goes off at 12. Will you be reasonable, Steve? Your call has cleared, San Marco. Washington, visit screen three. Herbert Ames, please. Security Commission Ames. Listen, to Ames. Hello, Hanson. Ames, you've got to get me to the chief. Are you kidding? He's at the test control room. Yes, I know, but get him for me. What's up? You look lousy. Or is it a bad circuit? There's no time. I've got to get him before the test. It's about the CR bomb. I can't take that responsibility. Get that through, Hank. Right, Blast. Hey, what's going on there? Ames, my project has a high enough rating. This is a priority A call. What? Well, okay, it's your neck. I'll try to get him for you. He's in the control room, so you'll have to switch off your screen and speaker and go on earphones. Too much going on in there. Security ruling. You hear that, Steve? I've got, to, I've got to cut the incoming screen. All right, but don't try anything. Eight minutes, Hank. Hello. Hello. What? You got him, Hank? Yes. This, this is Hanson at San Marco. No, sir. Priority A request to cancel the bomb test. No, no, I'm serious. This is deadly serious. We sent the X-2 JTR up today to the outer limit. We uncovered evidence. Yes, on the automatic instruments. What's that? No possible chain reaction. No, I, I can't tell you the whole story. There isn't time here. 
Yes, yes, I, I'll bring the readings into Washington in the morning. You've got to postpone the test till you see them. Look, I've worked on contracts for the commission for ten years. Yes, yes, I have complete confidence in my information. You can record that. All right, I, I'll call you back immediately. Bye. Hank? Hank? He's agreed to cancel, Steve. The bomb won't go off. All right, boy. You can come down out of that ship. He's opening up. Here he comes. All right, Steve. Come on down. Sure, Hank. Just a second. <sighs> Hank, I was scared. I was plain scared. Easy now. It's all over. The bomb won't go off. Thank God. Look, uh, I want to see Mary and the baby. <laughs> Can you get me transportation now? Well, wait a minute. It's almost 12. They won't let you in the hospital now. I want to see the baby. Sure you do, but you've been under a strain. I've got a shot for you here, Steve. Give you a good night's sleep. All right. Roll up your sleeve. Yeah, here. There. Yeah, that'll make you sleep. Sergeant will find you a bed. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Weston. Okay. Good night, Hank. I'm kind of beat. It's been a tough night. It sure has. I thought for a minute he was going to blast those rockets and send us all to Kingdom Come. Yeah. Quite a stunt getting the ray bomb test called off. It isn't called off. But the chief said... Ames couldn't get the chief. I was talking to a dead circuit. Bomb goes off in a couple of minutes. Oh. Poor Steve. He was one of the best. He was the best. One in ten million. Some story of his, poor guy. For a while, he almost had me believing that quarantine. That's a very common delusion. End of the world. Yeah. I suppose so. Ah, it's a nice night. Never saw the stars so bright. We better be getting in. That wind is cold. Huh? Well, the bomb goes off in 30 seconds. Poor Steve. You know, Hanson, there's just one thing. Yeah? It's outside my field, but I'm curious. How did he keep that ship in the air for ten hours with only ten minutes fuel? You have just heard The Outer Limit by Graham Dorr, an adventure in time, space, and the unknown dimension. <laughs> now, about next week, have you ever heard of the Mark III? The amazing electronic brain at Harvard that instantly solves the most complicated scientific problems. Suppose you had a mechanical brain like that in your house. A robot that was always at your service. So that you could just sit with folded hands and relax the rest of your life. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Perfect. That's what they thought when it happened in the year 2006. But they were wrong. Terribly wrong. How? I'll tell you next week. Tonight's story transcribed on Dimension X, The Outer Limit by Graham Dorr, was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Joseph Julian as Steve, Wendell Holmes as Hank, and Joe DeSantis as Major Donaldson. Your host is Norman Rose. Music was by Albert Berman. Sound designed by Sam Monroe. Edward King directed.
tomorrow, here's Sam Spade. Now it's Truth or Consequences on NBC. Adventures in Time and Space Told in Future Tense Dimension Have you ever heard of the Mark III? The amazing electronic brain they're using now up at Harvard University. In mere minutes, it can solve scientific problems that our most brilliant mathematicians would take years to work out. Its intelligence is almost superhuman. And yet the scientists are already working on a new and improved model, the Mark IV. In fact, they tell us there's no earthly reason why these thinking robots can't be perfected until they become the servants of the future, capable of doing all the work of mankind. Yes, that's what the advertising billboard said in the year 2006. Housework made easy by the perfect domestic servant, Modern Mechanicals Agency, Harry Underhill, President. The billboard showed a smiling family, sitting with folded hands, watching their mechanical robot pour their morning coffee. But in the home of Harry Underhill himself, things weren't quite as pleasant at breakfast this day. I just can't understand it, Aurora. Look at this. Modern mechanical's down three points. Yesterday, Smithson canceled his order. If I could only figure out why. Why don't you ask him? Well, Frank, there eat your oatmeal. Oh, Mom. I just don't understand it. Business was good, and then boom. Some louse must be undercutting my prices, that's all. How many robots were canceled? Not robots. Mechanicals, Aurora. How many times... They are robots, aren't they? Please, Aurora. There's an important difference in sales psychology. Maybe people are getting wise to your robots and mechanicals. What do you mean, Aurora? The perfect domestic servant. (laughs) They're ugly, stupid, clumsy, walking junk piles. Aurora. The one you brought home to me can't even wash the clothes properly. It's more trouble than it's worth. Aurora. You know our mechanicals are the best on the market. Those animated tin cans you sell? (laughs) They're certainly not making us any fortune. Well, with this new model, things are bound to pick up a little. That Jarvis order just comes through. Oh, that robot of yours. There's something knocking again. Hey, wait, wait. Put that plate back. I haven't finished my breakfast yet. Wait. Carl, you know you've got to say stop. 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 Hmm. (sighs) You always get excited. You think you never saw a robot before. Not robot. Mechanical. All right, all right. Look, it's not its fault. We just took too long to eat. Timing relay is set for 15 minutes. Never mind. I want my coffee back. Set. Set. There. Isn't that simple? It bends at the waist, stretches out its arm, and picks up the coffee pot just as if it were yours. Hey, watch out! I spilled it right in your lap! Oh, my (laughs) clean suit, Aurora! Oh, no! Carol, you know it's relayed to announce dinner after it sets the table. Hey, there goes my coffee again. Stop! Stop! Set. Harry, you can't give it two orders at once. What's that smell? There must be a short. Now see what you've done. Got it all upset. I did. All I said was... Harry! Stop. 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 Oh, it's no use. The brain coil shorted out. Well, do something. Harry, do Me, something. Me, I sure will. I'm going to the office. I'm getting out of here. Yes, Lucy? Mr. Jarvis, I'm... Oh, put him on. Hello, Underhill. Hello, Mr. Jarvis. I'm glad you called. I was just going to ring you. Well, I've got that whole shipment of mechanicals for you. One gross plane, a dozen of the chromium fitted. Hold on, Underhill. I'm canceling the order. You can... But the invoice is made out and I... Well, tear it up. I'm canceling. But why? Underhill, there's a brand new mechanical on the market that makes yours look like something out of a museum. Oh, now, look here, Mr. Jarvis. Don't look me, Underhill. I've seen them, and I'm telling you it'll put you out of business. Good night. Goodbye. Yes, Mr. Underhill? Uh, that's the third cancellation today. The world's going to pot. Yes, Mr. Underhill? Hmm? No, never mind, Lucy. I'm going home. What a day. I wonder 
of Aurora would smell it on me if I ducked into Garrigan's. She's got a nose like a beagle. Hey, that building wasn't here last week. Humanoid Institute, the perfect mechanical. <laughs> oh, no. We didn't have enough competition. Hey, these must be the cutthroats that are underselling me. At your service, Mr. Underhill. Huh? Oh, well, you startled me. <laughs> didn't hear you. Hey, you're a mechanical, aren't you? Not bad, not bad. Very lifelike. Won't you come in, please, and examine our service? Yeah, that's a remarkable voice. They've licked the variable inflection problem. You know, I'm in the same line myself. Of mechanicals, I mean. We're aware of that, sir. Oh? Hmm. Hey, some building you've got here. You sure got it up in a hurry. The Humanoid Institute at your service, Mr. Underhill. Yes? Oh, uh, how'd you know my name? For us, that was not difficult. Oh, is that so? Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. This is ridiculous. Talking to a mechanical. Must be somebody inside operating you by remote control. No, Mr. Underhill. Of course, there is Humanoid Central, which powers and controls all of us, but that is located on Wing 4. Wing 4? A planet in a remote part of the galaxy. Oh, oh yeah. Well, uh, may I see your salesman, please? We employ no human salesman, sir. We ourselves can accept your order for immediate humanoid service. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't expect me to buy one. I'm in the business myself. There will be no more need for your electronic mechanicals, sir. Once you have accepted our service, you will no longer have to work. Everything will be done for you. Everything? <laughs> That's quite an offer. At that rate, you'll have trouble supplying the demand. I think not, sir. As you can see from our storage room. Humanoids are now arriving at the rate of 5,000 per hour from Wing 4. 5,000 per hour? We are anxious to introduce our complete service on this planet, sir. To bring happiness to everyone. May we come out to your home for a free trial demonstration? No, I... Oh, I admit you're remarkable. The, the voice and movement, graceful even. But I'm still in business. And what's more, I wouldn't have you around the house. I'm afraid you will have no choice. Sooner or later, it will be necessary. Oh, is that so? Over my dead body, let me out of here. At your service, Mr. Underhill. Hmm. That's well, going to be tough competition, all right. Uh, I'm going to stop in at Garrigan's, the devil with Aurora's nose. <laughs> Hello, Frank. How was the football game? We won. 78 to 3. Guess what, Pop? You made all the touchdowns. Nope. Mom took in a border. She took... She what? Aurora! She said if your business was going to fall on its face, she had to do something to make some money. Oh, she did, huh? Harry, what's all the racket for? You, you tell me. What's this about a border? Oh, shh, Harry. He's going to live in that little apartment over the garage. Oh, no, he isn't. You know I don't want any strangers around here. Oh, Harry, please, shh. Look, he won't bother you. He's a nice old man. Oh. He just wanted a room and a place to work. He's an inventor, I think. Oh, he is, is he? Did he pay in advance? Well, he can't. You see, his mm -hmm. royalties haven't started to come in. Mm-hmm. Aurora, how can you be taken in by every beat-up old panhandler that gives you a sob story? Oh, Mr. Sledge isn't like that at all. Oh, that reminds me, dear. Can you give me a ten? A ten? What for? Well, Mr. Sledge is ill. He needs some medicine for his heart, and I said I'd lend him the money. You get... Oh, Aurora, this is the limit. He goes out right now. Now, don't be unkind, Harry. Besides, we need the rent money. Things aren't that bad yet. He goes. Please, shh. What are you shushing me for? Mr. Sledge, he's in the next room. I've invited him for dinner. Oh. <laughs> Frank, dear, wipe your mouth. Oh, Mom. More gravy, Mr. Sledge? No, thank you, Mrs. Underhill. Mr. Sledge, my wife tells me you're a traveling man. Uh, expect to move on, sir? Harry. I had hoped to do a little work, Mr. Underhill. You see, I've applied for basic patents here on Earth for a very important development. Oh, a new invention, huh? Yes. My field is rhodomagnetics. Rhodo what? Rhodomagnetics. 
It's a new force field theorem, key to the second triad of the periodic table. Rhodium, ruthenium, and palladium. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm a little rusty on my science. It's well known in other parts of the galaxy, but I've been able to apply for basic patents here. Worth uh, millions, huh? Perhaps you find it strange that the holder of such valuable property should be in need. Well, uh, yes. I'm a refugee, Mr. Underhill. I arrived on this planet only a few days ago. Mm-hmm. But you will be uh, shoving on again. Oh, for goodness sakes, Harry. That's all right, Mrs. Underhill. I understand. After all, I am an intruder in your home. And if it inconveniences you at all, I'll find some other place to sleep and set up my workshop. Oh. Harry, your robot is spilling the coffee again. I'll have to have it tightened up. Why doesn't your company bring out a better mechanical... One smart enough not to spill things. Wouldn't that be splendid? The perfect mechanical already exists, Mrs. Underhill. They're not so splendid, really. They are why I am a refugee today. Oh? Where'd you say you came from? Wing 4. Wing 4? Oh, then you must mean those humanoids. Humanoids? Mr. Sledge. Humanoids. What do you know about them? Well, they just opened an agency here in Two Rivers. No. No. <gasps> Harry. What is it? Well, what's wrong, Mr. Slade? Give him some water. It must be his heart. Go call Dr. Windows, Aurora. No, no. I'll be all right. Here, you better sit down. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It was just shock. I came here to get away from them. The, the humanoids? Yes. I wanted to finish my work before they came. But now... I won't trouble you any further. But, Mr. Sledge, Harry, he's sick. Well, uh, Mr. Sledge, I don't think you'll have to go right away. Oh, he can stay, Harry. Sure, after all, the way those humanoids are coming along, I'm liable to become a refugee myself any minute. <laughs> Guess we might as well stick together, eh, Sledge? Oh, that's better. Oh, you look ill, Professor. Maybe you ought to lie down on the sofa and rest. No, no, thank you. I must get back to my workshop now. I haven't got time to rest. There's so little time left for all of us. Good morning, Mr. Underhill. Good morning. Mr. Underhill, you look awful. I feel awful. What's in the mail? Six more cancellations. Mm. The Eat Quick restaurant chain sent back your shipment. They've installed humanoids. <laughs> Mr. McIntyre from the bank called. He's refusing your loan. He said since Humanoid Institute opened, you're a bad credit risk. Great. I guess that's all. Oh, there's somebody... Something to see you. At your service, Mr. Underhill. You? Oh, no, you're not the same one, are you? Serial number's different. It doesn't matter, sir. We're all really one. Now, in exchange for our complete service, you will assign all your property to Humanoid Institute. I will what? With our service, you will have no need for property. Everything will be provided. What kind of blackmail is this? No blackmail, sir. You will find humanoids incapable of committing any crime. We exist only to increase the happiness of mankind. Thanks, but I can take care of my own business. You have no choice, really. With humanoid service, it is no longer necessary for men to take care of themselves. Our function is to serve and obey and guard men from harm. Get out. Very well, sir. When you wish to sign, let us know. Get out. Get out. Aurora, I'm home. At your service, Mr. Underhill. What? What's the idea of this? You get out of here. Aurora! Mrs. Underhill has accepted our free trial demonstration. We cannot leave unless she requests... We'll see about that. Aurora, where the devil are you? Oh, hello, Harry. What's this mechanical doing here? What's happened to you? Isn't it wonderful? I had my hair done, the manicure. But, but, the humanoid did it and cleaned the house all over, washed all the clothes and gave Frank his music lesson. Now, wait a minute, Aurora. I, I won't... Have this monster in my house. Oh, it's just a free trial, Harry. Just wait till you taste the dinner it cooked. Everything you like best, roast duck. I don't care if he cooked a... Duck? And the most complicated pastries. I could never cook like that. Uh, well, might as well eat. But I'll need a drink first, though. All right, Doc. I'm sorry, sir. What? 
We exist under the prime directive to guard men from harm. Alcoholic beverages in excess are bad for human consumption. We have taken the liberty of removing them from the house. Now, look here. Mr. You Underhill, see... dinner is served. <laughs> Yes, Lucy? They're here, Mr. Underhill. I've been expecting them for a week. All right, Lucy. At your service, Mr. Underhill. We have the legal papers here, the bankruptcy forms, the eviction notice. We are ready now to foreclose your agency. Okay, take it over. A lot of good it'll do you. I haven't made a sale in two weeks. And now, if you will make the assignment of all your personal property, we can complete our service to you. What if I won't sign? That would be unfortunate. But with stubborn cases, we must sometimes resort to other methods. Eventually, Mr. Underhill, you will sign. Of all the darn, 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 hey, speaking hey, darn... Whoa, 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 Frank, what's the matter? What's the trouble, son? That old humanoid. Oh, you're not happy? You should be. It's guaranteed. They took away my football. Hmm. They said it was too dangerous to play with it. And my roller skates and my scout knife and everything. Did they leave you anything? Just some stinking old plastic blocks. Soft blocks. They said I couldn't get hurt with them. Dad, I want my football back. Can't you do anything? I don't know, son. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Underhill. Mind if I come in, Sledge? No, not at all. You mind if I keep working? Oh, go right ahead. It's good to see somebody working with his hands. There's something wrong? My son. The humanoids took his football away. They're everywhere. They've smashed my business, taken over my house. Sledge, isn't there some way to get rid of them? That is exactly what I am trying to do. You? What makes you think you can do anything? Because, you see, Mr. Underhill, I'm the unfortunate fool who started them. You? I don't understand. I started the humanoids. And I've been running from them ever since. You started them? Yes, I invented them. I built the ronomagnetic relays that operate Humanoid Central. But why? I... I wanted to bring happiness to humanity. <laughs> happiness? <laughs> That's great. My wife's been crying for two days. And do you know why? Because she's bored stiff. There's nothing left for her to do. They won't even let her lift a little finger. I don't blame you for feeling bitter, Mr. Underhill. It's all my fault. I wanted them to serve and obey God, men from harm. No, they do that all right. They've even emptied our medicine chest. It wouldn't do for one of us happy humans to end it all with a sleeping pill. Mr. Underhill, I've made the most terrible mistake a man can make. But I meant well, believe me. Then why did you do it? I thought I could rid the universe of poverty and hunger by inventing the perfect mechanical. Uh, they're perfect, all right. Too perfect. Yes. That's the trouble. They obey the prime directive too literally. They kill men's souls with their kindness. Uh, isn't there some way they can be controlled? No. I didn't trust mankind, so I made sure that Humanoid Central could not be tampered with. Not even by myself. Uh, then, then what hope is there? Only one. They are not creative. They can't meet new ideas. You mean you've got one, Sledge? Yes. They can defeat anything they know about. But I've got something new. A weapon to attack the brain of Humanoid Central. Is that what you've been working on? Yes. Now that they're here, there's little time left. Either we destroy them, or they will destroy us. Okay. What has to be done? This tuning circuit. Mm -hmm. You see, I need two bus bars here. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you read these diagrams? I think so. Got my degree in electronics. Good. If you could help on the bench work, it would save time. Uh -huh. I've got plenty of time now. All right. But watch yourself. Don't let them see you come out here. If you can take the risk, so can I. No. 
As the inventor, I built a special immunity for myself into Humanoid Central. But you don't have that immunity. They're rather unpleasant methods of dealing with their enemies. They can change you, you know. Change me? How? Brain surgery. What do you mean? Never mind. Just be careful. Mr. Underhill. Hmm? Uh, what do you want? You're going to meet with Mr. Sledge. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to collect the rent. Mr. Underhill, you have spent the past two afternoons in his room. In view of your association with Mr. Sledge, we feel that our free trial must be terminated. We suggest that you accept our total service and make the assignment of your property immediately. And if I don't? Then, sir, we may be forced to resort to other methods. Well, uh, g give me one more day to think it over. Very well, sir. Tomorrow. That will be your last chance. Is it? Underhill. Did they see you? No, not today. Sledge, we've got to hurry. It's difficult work, Mr. Underhill, but I'm almost finished. They gave me till today. They said they'd use other methods. What's that? The humanoids building some kind of a warehouse across the road. Sledge, are you sure this thing will work? It's a new principle, Underhill. A tuned rotomagnetic light beam. It should act to fission the heavy atoms of the basic ores and we fall. We'll destroy humanoid central. But are you sure? I know the humanoids. I made them. They can't invent anything. They can't create defenses against something new. It's done. It's finished, under you. You going to use it now? Immediately. I'll have to feed the astronomical data into the calculating circuits. There must be zero error in focusing. What will happen? Wing four will disappear in a chain reaction. Humanoid central will be destroyed. They'll stop. Ready now. Stand clear, please. Power's building up. Step on the rubber mat and down there. You must be shielded when I cut in the full power load. Hurry, Sledge. I've waited 30 years for this moment, Underhill. When Wing 4 is destroyed, the humanoids all over the galaxy will stop. They'll stop dead. You won't hear those drills. Sledge. All right. Now. anything? Sledge, listen. The drills have stopped. They've stopped. You can see them. The humanoids have stopped. They couldn't guard against something they couldn't understand. It worked under you. We're free now. Goodbye, Wing Four. Humanoid Central is destroyed. At your service, Mr. Underhill. No, Sledge. Get out of here. Get out. You were attempting to break the prime directive. It is therefore necessary to interfere. But you stopped. I saw you, all of you. In order to guard against Mr. Sledge's beam, it was necessary to stop all units momentarily to concentrate power. That necessity has passed. But it was new. You can't invent anything new. No, sir, but we were able to adapt the screening principle you yourself invented. For the past 30 years, Humanoid Central has been screened against any energy attack. All these years wasted. All these years? Your immunity has ended, Mr. Sledge. It will now be necessary for you to accept our full service. No. No, I'll stop you. I'll stop all of no, you. No, Sledge. I'll stop you with my bare hands. I'll kill you. Sledge, all. No, it's no you. Do not worry, Mr. Underhill. At worst, he can destroy one unit. There are millions more. Sledge, you'll hurt yourself. Sledge. I'll, I'll kill him. I... He's sick. It's his heart. You, get a doctor. Until he surrenders, we can neither aid nor hinder Mr. Sledge. Do you surrender your immunity, Mr. Sledge? Have to. Last chance. Gone. 
Yes, yes. Help me. Help me. At your service, Mr. Sledge. You may see Mr. Sledge now, Mr. Underhill. Alone? If you wish. In here. Thanks. Sledge. Well, well, Underhill. Good to see you. Your head. It's, it's bandaged. Is it really? They've done something to you. Are you all right? Oh, fine, fine. Never felt better. You never felt better? No. In fact, I feel ten years younger today. You sound so... so happy. Why not? These humanoids have made a new man of me, Underhill. They're wonderful, aren't they? Wonderful? How can you say that, Sledge? Only yesterday you hated them. You were trying to destroy them. Destroy them? Why? You don't remember? You've forgotten what they're doing to us all? They're killing us with kindness. Taking away all our incentive and pride of accomplishment. Turning us all into pampered, useless pets. Parasites. With nothing left to do but just sit with folded hands at the mercy of these mechanical monsters. At your service, Mr. Underhill. You. You seem troubled, Mr. Underhill. Are you unhappy? Unhappy? You bet I'm unhappy. What have you done to Professor Sledge to turn him into this babbling idiot? We were forced to operate. For years, Mr. Sledge has been suffering from a benign tumor of the brain. It caused him to have hallucinations, to believe that he was actually the creator of the humanoids. Did I? Yes. It was these delusions which were making you unhappy. Oh. <laughs> well, whoever did invent the humanoids, I certainly owe him a debt of gratitude now. Sledge. You see, Mr. Underhill, we have ways to correct these abnormal conditions. Even Mr. Sledge is happy now. You... you operated on his brain? Yes, Mr. Underhill. And now we are at your service. At my service? You mean you're going to operate on... No. The time has come for you to accept and enjoy our complete service. You will now sign our agreement. Look here, I... If you are unhappy, it only takes a simple operation. No, no. Well, who said I was unhappy? I'm very happy. I'll sign your paper. You don't have to operate on me. I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm very, very happy. Very <laughs> happy. The happy Mr. Underhill's futile hands clenched and relaxed again and then folded quietly. There was nothing else left for them to do. You have just heard the Jack Williamson story with folded hands, an adventure in time, space, and the unknown world of the future, the world of Dimension X. 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 Now, about next week, do you believe that in the mind of man there lies a force potentially more powerful than the atomic bomb? And perhaps someday, in the not-too-distant future, a man, sitting quietly in his room, just thinking, may generate enough mental energy to control the destiny of the world. How? We'll tell you next week. Tonight's story on Dimension X was adapted for radio by John Dunkel. Featured in the cast were Philip Borniff as Harry Underhill... Alexander Scorby as the humanoid, Peter Capel as Professor Sledge, and Brian Rayburn as Aurora. Your host was Norman Rose. Tomorrow, hear Sam Spade. Now, it's Truth or Consequences on NBC. <laughs> Adventures 
in time and space. Told in future tense. Dimension X X X X X X X X X The mind of man is still an unprobed field. Within it lie many mysteries still unsolved. But there are men today, psychologists now experimenting with telepathy, hypnosis, thought transference, who believe that in the future we may discover the existence of a force of the mind more powerful than any force the world has ever known. We go ahead now in time some ten years and in space to the campus of a small eastern college. The hour is late, and in one of the dark college buildings, two men stand in front of a door that bears the name Professor Arthur Barnhouse, Psychology. Well, here you are, Clinton. Thank you, Major. Here are the keys to the professor's desk and files. I guess you inherit everything now. You might as well dictate a full report while everything's still fresh in your mind. I'll wait and see you home. Oh, no, no, that isn't necessary. I'll be all right. You sure? After what's happened tonight, we wouldn't want you to have an accident, too. Major, after what happened tonight, I have a hunch the whole world is ripe for an accident. I'm afraid you're right, Clinton. Well, good night. Good night. Pull yourself together, Buster. Easy does it. August 21st, 1960. Restricted report from George Clinton to the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, the FBI, National Security Board, etc., etc., etc. Subject, the so-called Barnhouse effect and Professor Arthur Barnhouse who discovered it. I first met the professor two years ago in the fall of 1958. He was a professor of psychology here at Wilton College and I was here on an instructor's fellowship in the psych department. They assigned me to be Barnhouse's assistant, and he needed one. He hardly ever remembered to go to a class, and he didn't seem to do anything else either. For three months, I watched him sitting at the desk here in his study. He'd either stare at nothing for hours or fall asleep, nodding over his mess of papers. I couldn't understand it, and it was none of my business. But one day, I thought I'd better give him a shake. Uh, what? Uh, what? I said it's 2.15, Professor. Don't you want to go to your 2 o'clock class? Don't you want to mind your own business? I beg your pardon. Sorry, Clinton. Forgive me. I don't know what gets into me. Forget the class. The kids would rather be outdoors anyway. Okay, Professor. In that case, I'm sorry I woke you up. Uh, it's all right. I just can't seem to get my sleeping done at night. Clinton, what do you know about the international situation? Well, I'm no political scientist, if that's what you mean. I read the papers when I have time. Well, that's the way I've always been. Lately, I've had to look into it. I stay up nights looking into it. Uh, Professor, uh, I don't want you to take this personally or anything, but... Well, sir, I wonder if you'd mind if I asked to be transferred. You mean you'd rather work with somebody else in the department? Oh, no, sir. No, sir, it's not that. I, I think maybe there's a chance for a psychologist to work on that government project. Government project? Oh, yes, that uh, army thing. Yes, sir. They're trying to develop robot pilots for the new fighter rockets so they'd be expendable. Oh, yes, yes. Something else designed to replace men. Yes, sir. And you know, it's a funny thing. The robots work just like human brains. They get overworked or overloaded or something, and they have nervous breakdowns. Now, if I could only find out what drives those electronic brains crazy, why, I'd feel that I was... Uh, if you want to study a brain that's going crazy, never mind the robots, you can go to work on me. What are you talking about, sir? I don't know. I'm either crazy as a bed bug or a... Clinton, I wish you'd help me find out. Are you serious, Professor? I never was more serious in my life. I... I'm afraid I'm going out of my mind. But why? What makes you think so? This is what makes me think I'm crazy. Those dice? Clinton, do you know what the odds are against my rolling a seven? 
Oh, about five or six to one. Watch. Seven. Now, what are the odds against my rolling it again? Twice in a row? Plenty. About a hundred to one, I'd say. Watch. Professor, you're hotter than a two-dollar pistol. <laughs> it's funny. That's what they said eight years ago when I first discovered this. Discovered what? This force of the mind. I call it dynamo-psychism. You mean you shove those dice around just by thinking about it? People have always thought there could be a force of the mind. You know that. Fortunately or unfortunately, I've learned to control it. Yeah? Uh, how did you happen to find out about this, Professor? Well, it was about ten years ago, back in 1948. I made the mistake of going to a psychologist's convention. And in order not to appear unsocial, I happened to find myself, for the first and only time in my life, in a dice game. What happened? I didn't have the faintest idea what was expected of me. And someone told me to roll sevens. So I did. Ten of them. I'll bet you weren't asked back into that game. That night, in my room... I realized that it simply couldn't have been an accident, Clinton. I tried to reconstruct the exact scene, the position of my body, and finally, the thoughts in my mind. And that was what did it. I remembered what had been my train of thought, and I proceeded to roll sevens, not ten consecutive times, but fifty. Oh, brother, there it is again. Professor, can you do anything else? I mean, besides shove dice around? You see that inkwell on my desk? Sure. Watch it. Don't take your eyes off it. If nothing happens, say so, and I shall go quietly, even happily, to the nearest sanitarium. Okay, Professor, shoot. Hey, you... Why, it just blew up. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to splash ink on your suit. Well, that, that That's okay, Professor. What... What was that funny noise? Oh, that. The dynamo psychic waves are a little like ultra-high frequency waves. Sometimes when I turn on the power, they, they create a kind of static. Listen, Professor, how much power have you got? Could you blow up anything, well, you know, big? I could flatten the Great Wall of China. Boy, you'll make the helio-oxygen bomb look sick. And that's what scares me, Clinton. The thought that maybe I could use this power to save the world. Clinton... You've got to help me. Who, me? Professor, when it comes to international relations, I don't know from where. You'd better get in touch with the State Department. State Department? Yes, they'd be the ones, wouldn't they? Well, you probably want to be getting home now. I'll see you to the door. I could use a breath of fresh air. Okay, Professor. you better stop brooding about this. You get somebody else to do your worrying for you. Yes, yes, you're right. I have been brooding, wondering what to do. Just sitting and staring endlessly at that awful monstrosity across the way. You mean the old bell tower? Yes, I've gotten so I can't stand the sight of it anymore. Professor! Professor, look what... Oh, well, there's nothing left but a pile of rubble. Oh, my, I didn't really mean to do that. Well, you see, Clinton, it's got to the point where my lightest whim is more dangerous than a blockbuster. Professor, you get in and write that letter to the State Department right now. You pack too much of a wallop. <laughs> Professor Barnhouse mailed his letter and things happened fast. A long arm of the army reached out, and within five days, the two of us were deposited in an old mansion in Virginia, surrounded with a barbed wire fence and 20 guards, and labeled top secret. As soon as they'd seen a couple of small demonstrations, they set up a big test of dynamo psychism, and the professor was a very important guy. You could see him getting more unhappy every day. General Barker, I've got to talk to you. Just a minute, Professor. We're cleaning up the last details in Operation Brainwave. We'll roll at 1,400 hours tomorrow. At 1,400 what? Two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Robot control fighter rockets will take off at exactly 1,400 minus 10 and appear over the target at 1,400. Watching from here over the video screen, you will then try to knock all 20 of them out of the sky. Think you can do it? Of course I can do it. Fine. But... 
And we're taking care of everything. Everything, except that you neglected to ask me if I wanted to do it. I don't. This whole thing strikes me as childish and insanely expensive. We'll decide about that. But what's the good of it? I wouldn't mind acting as a defense weapon if it were necessary. But I can make all wars and armaments unnecessary. I could give every nation what it needs. I could move mountains, build roads, dig irrigation canals. I have a technique which costs nothing and can do immense good. You're spending millions to prove that it can do immense damage. It doesn't make sense. You know something, General? He's right. Of course I'm right. I want you to send me and Clinton back to Wilton College. Right away. That's quite impossible, Professor. This operation has gone too far to be called off now. Yes, but... Even if we wanted to call it off. If your dynamo psychism really works, you're apt to be the key to our entire defense setup. Uh, But listen... You'll have to excuse me now. Major Cuthrell and I have to double-check the confidential list of the observers on this end. Have you got a major? Uh, Yes, General. It's right here. Uh, Alberts, Barker, Bernstein, Carter, Clinton, Cuthrell, Holbrook, Lawrence, Stein, Williams. Check. I guess that includes everybody of importance. Uh, What about me? What? Oh, uh, that's taken for granted, Professor. Thanks. Fourteen hundred hours. Will you be ready? I'll be ready. And now, if someone will wind the restricted clock and put the confidential cat out, I'm going to bed. YDR to brainwave control. Observation plane to brainwave control. Come in, please. That's McKinley in the observation plane. Cut me in. Hello, McKinley. Reading you clear on the speaker. Everything all right? All okay, General. Take off uneventful. Fighter rockets now flying on course in perfect formation. Altitude 5,000 feet. Airspeed 865. Visibility unlimited. Are you tracking us? We've got you on radar. Haven't picked you up on the video screen yet. What's your estimated time of arrival over the target? ETA, two minutes. Check. Remember, McKinley, the observation plane is not to enter the target range. Veer off and circle at the 10-mile limit. Bring the rockets overhead by remote control. Check. Observation signing off. One minute, 45 seconds to go, Professor Barnhouse. Are you in good shape? I'm all right, General. Good. We can all take our places in front of the video screen now. You sit here, Professor, in the center. Major Cuthrow, will you turn on the video screen? Right, General. Nothing yet, just empty sky. Uh, hold it. Uh, I hear him coming in. There are 20 of them, Professor. Do you think you can knock them down at this altitude? Uh, distance has nothing to do with it. I don't want anything to go wrong. You're sure you feel all right? General, I know I can do it. If that's all that's worrying you, let's call the whole thing off and save $20 million. There they are. They're coming in. Get ready, Professor. Ten seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Now, wide open, Professor. Well, go ahead, Barnhouse. Knock them down. I did. Nonsense. All you've done is blank out the video screen. What went wrong? Did you give it everything you had? I was wide open, General. Then it didn't work. They're still flying there. What's that? It just took a few seconds to work. That's... Holy smoke, they're dropping like flies. McKinley, the brainwave control. Look What's happened to these rockets? They're going down like flames. Boy, heaven, it works. It really works. Cutthroat, get Washington on the line. Barnhouse, I want you to... Hey. Hey, where's Barnhouse? I was right here. where's the professor? Got me, General. We were all staring at the video. You must have walked out. Get moving, everybody. Alert the guard. Search the house. Yes, sir. If anything happens to that man... General Barker. General Barker. What is it, Corporal? Corporal Gray, guard at the main gate. Sir, Professor Barnhouse is gone. Oh. Gone? Where? He came tearing out of the gate at 40 miles an hour. Here's a note, sir. Do it out of the car as he went by. I picked it up. Let me say it quick. What the... What got into that man? What does he say, General? Gentlemen... As the first superweapon with a conscience, I am removing myself from your national defense stockpile. Setting a new precedent in the behavior of ordnance, I have humane reasons for going off. Signed, 
Arthur Barnhouse. Barnhouse was gone. Within 12 hours, the world was on a spree. The headlines were glorious or terrible, depending on what you think of the things the way they are. Get up, Barnhouse, wet helio bomb factory! The dynamo psychic waves reached every corner of the world. In every country, every continent flashed the news of what was happening. Hey, Barnhouse knocks out hidden atomic stockpile in Asia! There was a new kind of war, the war of tattletales. Secret agents of every country hunted for the hidden armaments of their enemies, yelled about them in the newspapers, and immediately there'd be that warning burst of Barnhouse static, followed by... radio control fleet blown up on secret maneuver! The professor was out to make peace or bust, and nothing like him ever was. Look, Major Cuthrell, I told the FBI and the Army everything I know weeks ago. I've answered questions till I'm blue in the face. I didn't come here to ask questions, Clinton. I came to ask for your help. My help? That's right. To find Barnhouse. What if I don't want to? If you're his friend, I think you'd better. Why pick on me? You've got the FBI, the police, and Army intelligence. Why can't you find him yourself? We're trying. But you know the man well. You could spot him where we wouldn't. And you're the only one who can. Maybe. But why should I? Wherever he is, I think he's doing fine. He's making war impossible, and I like it. So do I. Yes? He's putting you out of a job. That's all right with me. I'll retire to a truck farm with pleasure. Well, then? Look, Clinton. We aren't the only ones in this race. Every country in the world has its best agents out hunting for Barnhouse. Nobody can beat that kind of a manhunt. He seems to be doing all right so far. Sure, but how long do you think he can keep it up? A week? A month? Sooner or later, he'll be spotted. And if the wrong people find him, then we're done for. You know what kind of weapon this is. Whoever controls the Barnhouse effect can control the world. Well, all right. Suppose they do find him. He'd never give the secret away. Never give it away? Are you out of your mind? You think these fellows are playing for marbles? Well, no, but... Read I... the papers, Clinton. Don't you know what's going on in the rest of the world? Well, yes, They'll but... get the secret out of Barnhouse, all right. What happens to him in the process won't be very pretty. Well, he... he must realize that, then. He'll... he'll never let himself be taken alive. He may not have the choice. And if he doesn't... God help us all. All right. All right, I'm in. Good. Now, do you know anything that you haven't told us? Anything that might give us a lead? Only this. It was addressed to me. I found it here on his desk the morning after he escaped. You mean he came back here? Yes. I guess he needed to pick up some personal effects. Anyway, the files were open, and he left this note on a scrap of paper. Anything to do with the Barnhouse effect? Read it yourself. It's Greek to me. Just these few lines scrawled on a piece of paper, and the last one breaks off right in the middle of the sentence. Hmm. This stuff doesn't make any sense at all. You know, from the looks of this, I'm beginning to wonder if the professor isn't going off his rocker. I thought of that, too. All the more reason why we've got to get to him quick. He may be helpless, and the whole world's on his track. Come on, Clinton. We haven't much time. You say you do recognize this photograph, Mrs. Reardon? I tell you, it looks like Mr. Balfour's. He had the second-floor front room for quite a while, but he left, oh, I should say, about a week ago. Say, is he wanted for something? Yes, if he's the man I think he is. Well, now, I'd say you're looking for the wrong fella. That Mr. Balfour, he couldn't be a criminal. Why, he wouldn't even harm a fly. He spent all his time in his room, just thinking. Oh, brother, it's hot. What a way to spend an August afternoon, huh, Major? Give my eye teeth to be at Jones Beach. So would I, Corporal. We've got work to do here. Look, so we've been cruising around these radio detection cars for a week. Not a sign of Barnhouse static. The professor must have run out of things to work on. Well, we'll give him a little more time. Switch to shortwave. See if there's anything special coming through. Yes. Try the nine minute wave. Radio Mirage. Uh, let's hear that. Our American enemies who have hidden behind the unjust and diabolical persecution by Professor Arthur Barnhouse uh -oh. will tyrannize us no more. I wonder if the professor's on May our glorious leader takes up his residence in a shelter, shielded with lead against all dynamo-psychic threat. Hmm. With his 
protection designed by our brilliant scientists to be absolutely impregnable against the burn house effect, he will once again lead us on the path of our glorious death. Quick, triangulate it and get me a fix. I've got it. Let me check this chart. Quick, man. 3.9, 1.7. Oh, my aching back. What is it? We haven't got a prayer of finding a major. He'd have to be picked out of two million people. Where is Von Hoff? Right where I was wishing I was. Right smack in the middle of Jones Beach. <laughs> Gents, we're full. No more rooms tonight. We don't want a room. Do you recognize this picture? Who wants to know? Uncle wants to know. Oh. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, let me see it. I... Yeah. Yeah, it looks a lot like room 417. About five feet eight, thin, sandy hair, yeah. glasses, little scar right across the bridge of his nose. Yeah, that's 417, all right. You mean he's here now? No, not anymore. He checked out two days ago. But he couldn't have gone far. What makes you say that? Oh, he looked sick as a dog. <laughs> couldn't hardly carry his own bag out. Uh-oh. Like I said to the other fellas, I said he looked like he was on his way to the morgue. What other fellas? <laughs> oh, the, the ones this morning. You're the second pair that's been asking for him. Here we are, Ward 15. This way, gentlemen. You're sure he's here, nurse? Oh, yes. Thank heaven we're in time. Well, I wasn't on duty when he came in, but one of the other girls told me he'd collapsed in the street. The ambulance brought him in. Okay, he must have really had it rough. Oh, uh, here you are. Bed number 78. This is your man. Wait a minute. This isn't Barnhouse? But oh, I was perfectly sure. Oh, wait, let me check his chart. Dismissed 8 p.m. Only an hour ago. Oh, dear, now I remember. Remember what? If he was sick, why did you let him go? Well, two of his friends came and took him away. They didn't want him in the charity ward. They said they'd make sure that he was taken care of. Every time I walk into this study, I keep hoping somehow I'll wake up out of a bad dream and find the professor just sitting here. Major, is there anything we haven't covered? Nothing. The police, the FBI, the air patrols, the docks, the railroad stations, everything. Not even a flea could get through this dragnet. I hope. Then I guess we sit. We sit. Maybe something will come in. You have to roll those dice. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't thinking. An hour. That's what's driving me crazy. One hour sooner and he'd have been in our hand, not theirs. I know. Well, maybe he's still all right. How can he be all right? He's in the hands of a foreign power. We don't know that for sure. The professor was a likable little duck guy. He couldn't have lasted this long if he hadn't found some friends. Maybe they came and took him away. Well, I... Grab that. Hello? Yes? Is that you? Professor Barnhouse. Clinton, they've got me. Who's got you? Where are you, Professor? I don't know. They said something about taking me to an airport. An airport? Which one? Listen, Clinton, I've got to tell you. The inkwell. What are you talking about? Remember the inkwell? <coughs> Professor. <coughs> Professor Barnhouse. Operator. Operator. Your call, please. Operator, that call that just came in here. Can you trace it? I'm sorry, sir, but I'm afraid it's too late. Your party has been disconnected. Where are we headed? He didn't say which airport, just a hunch. The commercial airfields are all covered. But there's a little private field out here, I remember. Hasn't been used in years. Better be the one. They didn't have too much of a start on us. Maybe we'll make it in time. Step on it, Corporal. Wide open, Major. How, how'd he sound? Did he say who had him? No, all he got out was the airport and something about an Major, airport. Mr. Clinton, there's a tail light up ahead. Must be another car going like the devil. You're right, I see it. They're turning into the airfield. Come on, faster. Hold everything. Look up ahead. They're switching the floodlights on at the field. There's the plane down at the other end, all warmed up and ready to go. We'll never make it on the road. Hang on, I'm going through the fence. Right. 
What's the matter? Get going. Sorry, sir. Must have cracked the axle. They're taking off. Get out the submachine gun. You can't. Barnhouse is in that plane. You'll kill him. We've got to take that chance. That plane's headed straight for us. Hit the dirt. Get that gun working, Corporal. Aim for the propeller. Couldn't get him, Major. Well... There goes the old ball game. I'll get through to air patrol, sir. Maybe they can intercept the plane. Oh, not a chance. By the time the fighters got off the ground, the plane would be out of range. No, we've lost, Barnhouse. Nothing can save us now. Hey, what? <laughs> what hit me? Clinton, are, are you all right? Yeah, yeah sure. The, the plane. It's gone. I know. Barnhouse blew it right out of the sky. He wouldn't let himself be taken alive. Boy, he really did it the hard way. Poor guy. He shouldn't have had to be a hero. All he ever wanted was peace. Peace? What's that? Now the arms race will start all over again. And with Barnhouse gone, what's left to stop it? So they brought me back here to the professor's old study to dictate this report. I'm sitting here at his desk, and it's just the way he left. Papers all over, even his old pair of dice. Arthur Barnhouse is dead. That's going to be good news for some people when they find out. The saber rattlers of the world will be busy as of tomorrow morning, getting ready to whoop up another war. I'm afraid they're in for a little surprise. 3 a.m. now. And before morning comes, I intend to vanish, disappear completely. That's the last that anybody will ever see or hear of me directly. That's why I want to tell you now. I've been looking at the new inkwell here on the desk. The professor's last words were something about an inkwell. And in it, I found a little scrap of paper, just a few words, but they complete the note I showed the major. The note that didn't make any sense. The whole thing makes sense now. Professor Barnhouse may be dead. But you haven't heard the last of the Barnhouse effect. Not yet. I've been experimenting while I've been talking to you. And now the time has come for me to say goodbye. You see, I've just rolled my 50th consecutive seven. You have just heard Report on the Barnhouse Effect by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. An adventure in time, space, and the unknown. Dimension X. X, 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 Next week, the strange story of the interspace rocket Star Cloud, which vanished mysteriously behind the great galactic barrier in the year 1986. What happened to it and to its crew? We'll tell you next week. Tonight's story, Report on the Barnhouse Effect, was adapted for radio by Clarice A. Ross. Featured in the cast were Bill Quinn as Clinton, Ed Jerome as Professor Barnhouse, and Carl Weber as Major Cuthrow. Your host was Norman Rose. Music, Albert Berman. Engineer, Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Tomorrow, hear Sam Spade. Now, it's Truth or Consequences on NBC.
Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. Can you predict what will come in 100 years, or in 10, or in the next minute? Can you see beyond the known dimensions of time and space into the unknown dimension X? It was in the year of 1982 that spacemen first discovered the Great Galactic Barrier. In the past 10 years, rocket travel to the moon and the nearer planets had become commonplace. And then men fixed their sights on a more distant star, the remote planet known as Volta. Five exploratory ships went out, and none came back, each in turn disappearing mysteriously at the same vanishing point, an invisible wall somewhere in the vast outer reaches that became known as the wrecker of spaceships, the Galactic Reef. And yet, the explorers refused to admit defeat. It was on June the 2nd, 1987, that the rocket Star Cloud made ready for takeoff, the sixth to attempt to crack the barrier and win through to Volta. Now hear this. Condition blue. One minute till blast off. Now hear this. Condition blue. One minute till blast off. Bridge to nav control. Navigation. Call you. This is Captain Thorson. Ready, Lieutenant? We're ready, Captain. The course is in the integrator for takeoff at 1,200 hours. All right, stand by for acceleration. Bridge to engine room. Fire up your rocket chambers. Take off at exactly 1,200 hours. I'll read you off. 30 seconds. 29. 28. 27. 26. Condition right. Hold it. Revoke all orders. Who turned in that alarm? We've uncovered a stowaway, sir. Stowaway where? I think it's sick bay. Dr. Smithson found him. Have him brought up to the bridge. Engine room. Kill your rockets. Stand by. Motion. This is Colonel Harrison in ground control. What's holding you up? Trouble. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? There's stowaway aboard. Stowaway? Yes, I thought your men were supposed to police this place. What's the matter with you? All right, Captain. Take it easy. You know what this delay can do to us, don't you? One minute later, take off can throw us a million miles off course. We'll have to reintegrate the whole works. Well, look, how long do you think it'll take? Don't bother me for a while. I'm busy here. Stupid idiot. Come in. Here's your stove, eh, sir? Now, court, Marshal. Charlie. Ken, uh, you use a good radio man, Skipper? Oh, I see you two have met. Met? The Skipper and me made 50 trips to the moon together. Didn't we, Captain? Charlie, if you wanted to come along, why didn't you volunteer? I did, Skipper. They turned me down. What's wrong with you? Oh, acceleration bends. They said my arteries wouldn't stand another trip. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But they're wrong, sir. I got one more good trip in me. Now, listen, Captain. You know these green kids don't know the first thing about space radio operation. You put a man like me on and I'll be getting you bedtime stories from Mars. Well, you know the regulations as well as I do, Charlie. I can't take you as much as I'd like to. Colonel Harrison will murder me for this. I'm sorry, Charlie. I've put you aground. Tell you what, Charlie, I'll ask Harrison to put you on his ground radio contact. It'll seem as if you're right here with us. He won't do it, sir. He better. I'll have him busted to corporal for letting you sneak aboard. You'd be better off, Charlie. Paulison. Yes, sir? I'm sending a man down from the bridge. Put him aground. Give him time to clear the launching platform. Yes, sir. So long, Charlie. Sorry. Well, good luck, Skipper. Thought you were going to have him drawn and quartered. And anybody else, I would have, Smitty. But Charlie, well, Charlie's kind of special. He's been with me since my first command. When we began the regular run to the moon. If he wanted to come along this time, well, it's only through loyalty to me. You know, Lewis, I didn't realize it before, but you're almost human. Navigation. Lieutenant Collier. Nav control, Collier. Lieutenant, how badly we fouled up. Can you recalculate the course? Or shall I cancel the takeoff? I've already plotted a new course on the integrator, sir. Well, that's quick work. Are you sure? Positive, sir. All right, Collier. Putting it in your hands. We'll blast off in your signal. Uh, Lewis, isn't that a lot of responsibility for a young green officer? Yeah, but if he can't do his job, I'd rather find out now than at the galactic barrier. 
Bridge to engine room. Ready your rockets. Prepare to blast off on navigator's signal. How are we doing, Collier? Coming on the bearing, sir. Huh? Four, three, two, zero. We've intersected the course vector. That's good work, Carter. Course corrected, sir. Ready to go into atomic overdrive anytime you say. All right, stand by. Now hear this. Prepare for maximum acceleration. Bridge to engine room. Kill your rockets. Rockets out. Fire up number one cyclotron. Number one ready. Fire up number two. Number two ready. Engineering, withdraw your dampening rods. Mission chamber ready. Last tubes are clear. Ready. Take it on overdrive. How are we doing, Collier? On course, sir. She's running hot and true. Well, my compliments, Lieutenant. This job would have done your father credit. He was the best navigation officer I ever saw. Thank you, sir. Start your gyros, put her on robot control. All right, the ship is yours, Mr. Collier. If you need me, I'll be in Dr. Smithson's office. Yes, sir. Thank you, young Collier, for that. Chip off the old block. Oh, you knew his father, huh? Matter of fact, I knew him very well. First rate spaceman. Is he the one who. Yeah, uh... yeah. Oh. yeah he was lost in the galactic barrier on the second ship we sent out to Boulder. Lewis, uh, just what do you think this galactic barrier is? Uh, your guess is as good as mine, Doc. All I know is that five ships have gone into it, and none of them have come back out. You think it's an it? How about Mestrovic's theory that it's a time warp in space, but that the ships reach it and slip into another dimension? I think that's rubbish. My theory is that the galactic barrier is nothing more than a radioactive layer of some kind. What makes you say that? Well, we know that radar signals bounce off it like they were hitting an invisible glass wall. We know it destroys our ships and our crews in some way. Uh, there's no other logical explanation. What makes you think we can get through it? Because we're ready for it. The others weren't. Tire hull is completely shielded with lead. We can crack through any radioactive cloud ever detected. Besides, we're equipped with some new UHF radio devices that should enable us to maintain radio contact with Earth. Nothing can happen. Absolutely nothing. Who are you trying to convince, Lewis? <sighs> Myself, I suppose. Smitty, five ships are missing. And men like Prentice and Margetson and young Collier's father. I'm tired of seeing good men fed into that meat chopper. Then why are we going? We haven't any choice, Smitty. We're in a race. The kind of race where men and ships are expendable. Well, at least it won't be boring. I'll have to play physician morale builder and mother substitute for 112 slightly nervous men. <laughs> Your morale doesn't sound too good, Doctor. As morale officer, I can state without fear of contradiction. It's terrible. And something tells me that as we approach that galactic barrier, I'm not going to be alone. Captain Thorson of the Star Cloud calling Earth. Star Cloud to Earthbound. Can you read me? Hello, Star Cloud. Hi, Captain. Charlie. Oh, I see they haven't court martialed you yet. No, sir. Thanks to you. Well, Charlie, it's good to hear you. You can read us the funny papers on Sunday morning. Right. How's the signal? Strong. Clear the bell. All right. Here's our log report for Colonel Harrison. Ready? Shoot. June 2nd, 1987. Four weeks out from Earth. Running true, no radiation, operation normal. Still making our approach to the galactic barrier. That's all, Charlie. See you later. Good luck, Captain. I sure wish I was with you. Well, how's the morale, Smitty? Well, uh, the men know we're getting closer to the barrier. They're beginning to show a little tension, Lewis. How's their physical condition? Any sickness? About half the crew has come down with space blues. Badly? Oh, same as usual. Lips and hands with a bluish cast. 
Eyes sensitive to infrared. I don't know. When I first started flying these tin cans, nobody ever heard of space blue. Well, there's a new theory that is caused by the terrific acceleration of these atomic overdrive ships. Uh, the change in gravity affects the circulation. What do you think? Oh, I think it's psychosomatic. I've noticed that the same men who get space blues under tension on a ship tend to get blue coloration back on Earth when they're upset. I guess it's an occupational disease of space navigators. You think it's just nerves, then? I don't know. But young Collier has a bad case. I think it's tension from overwork. Maybe he needs some vitamins. Lewis, when will you realize that vitamins are not the panacea for all the troubles of mankind? Sir, I understand you've relieved me from duty. Dr. Smithson says that you aren't looking very well. I'm giving you a rest. I feel perfectly able to continue, sir. Your lips are as blue as Minnetonka. I'd like to remain at my post, Captain. Don't be foolhardy, Lieutenant. I'm not being foolhardy, sir. I have a special personal reason for wanting this expedition to reach Volta. Your father? Yes, sir. You think he might still be alive? I have to find out what happened, sir. I think I understand. Very well, Collier. Report back to duty. What's the reading, Paulison? We're getting a plus five radar bounce now. It's coming off the barrier almost as fast as we send it out. What's the interval? Three tenths of a second. Shortening steadily. At this rate, we'll hit the wall in the next few minutes. All right, alert the crew. Sound general quarters. Now hear this. Condition red. We are now approaching the galactic barrier. All hands to stations. All radiation detectors to be fully manned. Full security will prevail until further notice. That is all. Paulison. Aye, sir. Radar bounces up to plus six. We better try to make final contact with Earth. Spark's still trying to raise the base? Yes, sir, but he's not having much luck. There seems to be some interference. That's the radio room now. Yes? You've got him? Cut in the bridge speaker. The captain will take it from here. Hello, star cloud to earthbound. Can you hear me, Earth? Hello, Skipper. I can barely read you. We're getting heavy static from sunspots. That's not sunspots. We're right on top of the galactic barrier. Stick with us, Charlie. We're switching to the automatic sender now so you can track us in. Okay. If we crack the barrier and come through still in one piece, I'll try to get back to you on the high frequency band. Gotcha, Skipper. Don't worry. I'll be waiting. So long, Charlie. So long, star cloud. We must be getting awfully close now, Captain. The echo's bouncing back so fast, it's almost beating the signal. And they coincide. Hold on to your hat. That's when we run into the wall. Any second. Hold on. Well, here goes nothing. Here it comes. Captain? Why? Why, nothing happened. We made it. We made it, Captain. No radiation, no time warp, no nothing. <laughs> hey, the crew's gone crazy, sir. Let them. They earned it. Say, Doc. Doc, can you break out a few bottles of snake bite serum for medicinal purposes? I sure can. This Lewis. calls for a celebration. How's your morale now? Wouldn't huh? it be better? How's yours? Condition hey, what? Radiation what is... detected. Condition red. Radiation detected. Good. Holy mackerel. Look at the needle on that indicator. Paulison, Paulison. I see it, Captain. We're picking radiation like crazy. What's it like? It's a strong wave. What kind is it? I don't know. It's too long for a cosmic ray and too short for UHF. All right, track it down. Triangulate it. Make it fast. I want a directional fix. Yes, sir. Engine room. Yes, sir. We're picking up radioactivity. Is it the fission chambers? No leak, sir. Check your gauges. Nothing here, Captain. Must be coming from outside. Damage control. Yes, sir. Is our lead shield leaking radiation? Haven't found anything yet, sir. All right, keep at it. Paulison, how are you doing? I've got a fix, Captain. Well, what is it? I have to recheck my figures. Well, hurry up. The angle is correct, but I don't... Come on, man, for Pete's sake. It's right, sir. What's right? Speak up. Where's the radiation coming from? It's coming from inside this ship. That's impossible. No, sir. I've checked it twice. Well, then, there's only one thing left to do. Paulison, get a Geiger counter. We're going to start combing the ship inch by inch. Ready, sir. All right. Turn it on now. Yes, sir. There. We'll check the atomic guns first. <coughs> Cut through the officers' quarters to ordinance. Come on. Wait a minute, sir. What is it? Signal's weaker now. Let's go back. 
Hold it. Seems strongest right about here. It doesn't make sense. Whose cabin is it? Lieutenant Collier's. Collier! It's probably down in nav control, sir. Try the door. No, it's not locked, sir. It's in here, all right. Listen to that counter. Strongest over here. Open that wall cabinet. It's locked. Smash it. All right, shut off the Geiger counter. What do you make of this, Pollen, sir? Well, it looks like some sort of portable transmitter, sir. Must be foreign manufacture. I don't recognize the calibration symbols at all. Never seen anything like it. Which raises a small question. What is Lieutenant Collier doing with a transmitter in his cabin? I don't know, sir. Well, I intend to find out, Paulison. Get down to nav control. Bring Collier up to the bridge. On the double. Well, hadn't we better find some way to shut this thing off first? I know a way. Lieutenant Collier, I'm going to ask a few simple questions, and I want a few simple answers. Yes, sir. What were you doing with the transmitter in your cabin? Transmitter, Captain? You know nothing about it? No, sir, I don't. Do you recognize these calibration symbols? No, sir. Can you think of how it might have been placed in your cabin without your knowing it? No, sir. Unless someone came in while I was on duty. Would that have been possible? Why, uh, I suppose if, uh, if someone had a key... I uh, found your cabin door unlocked. Well, I'm in a key to the wall cabinet. I didn't say the wall cabinet. Well, well sir, I... You what, Lieutenant? How could you have known it was in the wall cabinet? I just assumed... Lieutenant Collier, I find it hard to believe you would lie, having known and respected your father and having observed the way you handled your job. However, I intend to get to the root of this thing. May I have your wristwatch, Lieutenant? Sir? Your wristwatch. Yes, sir. Pollison, turn on that Geiger counter. Yes, sir. Hold this watch next to it. Yes, sir. That's all. Lieutenant, if you hadn't any close contact with that transmitter... How do you explain the radioactivity of this watch? I don't, sir. I think you'd better. To whom are you sending those signals? Condition red! Condition red! There's your answer, Captain. What is this, Collier? Alien spaceship approaching! Alien spaceship approaching! Sound battle stations. Collier, who's aboard that ship? All right, now talk, man! Very well, Captain. My mission seems complete. Your mission? Are you admitting that you're an agent of a foreign power? I am stating it. What nation? No nation, Captain. What? I am an agent of the Voltan government. The what? The government of the planet of Volta. You're crazy. Are you so stupid that you think your people are the only ones who can invade another planet? What do you mean? We've had agents operating on Earth since 1945. I don't believe you. What do you think happened to those five ships, Captain? Where do you suppose we got our information, your language, your culture, family background? But your appearance, you look... Like Commander Collier? Is that so surprising, Captain? We had a living model. I ought to kill you. That would be very foolish. I would advise you to surrender without delay. Alien ship, now coming in ordnance range. I'll deal with you later, Collier. Follison, sir, put this man in irons. Take him away. Don't worry, sir. We'll take good care of him. Carpenter, hey, Robinson. Gunnery. Gunnery, Richardson. What's the range? 10,000 meters are closing fast. Put your guns on radar tracking. Tracking. Coming on a burn. <laughs> Fire. Fire. Richardson, you hear me? Fire. What's the matter down there? Did you hear me? Richardson, answer me. It's no use to shout, Captain. Collier. Yes, Captain. How'd you get loose? Where's Pollison? Lieutenant Pollison is dead. All stations. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Collier has escaped. escaped. Seize him, man. Don't waste your breath. Your men can't hear you, Captain. What? Those still alive are my men. You're lying. No, Captain. Every ship that has ever left Earth was controlled by a Voltan crew. That's impossible. Those were hand-picked men. Hand-picked by us. I don't believe you. Then why not call for help? Carpenter, Carpenter Robinson, Robinson, Haley, report. report. Carpenter, Carpenter Robinson. Robinson. Report. You see, Captain, it is quite useless. I would advise you to sit very quietly and do nothing. It isn't possible. They can't all be dead. Smitty! Dr. Smithson! Smitty! Smitty, what have they done to you? Oh, those dirty... Uh, don't, don't talk, Smitty. Yeah, closer. Not much no time. Lewis, 
Space blues. Space blues. What is it, Smitty? Uh, what are you trying to tell me? All men with space blues. Of all time. Here, let me help you, Smitty. No, Lewis. Get message back to Earth. Voltan, fifth column. Watch out for space blues. Uh, Smitty. Smitty. Hello? Hello? Star Cloud calling Earth Cloud. Please, God, let me get through before it's too late. Hello, Star Cloud to Earth Cloud. Come in, please. Come in, please. <laughs> Hello? Hello, can you hear me, Charlie? Skipper, is that you? Are you getting my signal? It's coming in a little louder now, Skip. Keep sending. Thank God, Charlie. Now listen to me. Not much time. Get word to Colonel Harrison. Crew mutinied. Most of crew members, Voltan. What? Voltan. Spell that. V-O-L. Voltan. That's right. They're from the planet Volta. Skipper, are you all right? Charlie, this is serious. They'll be here any second. Now listen. They have a fifth column on Earth. They're planning to invade you. You don't mean it. I get you. Captain! Captain! Captain Thorson! Hello! Hello, Star Cloud! Come in! What's the trouble, Sergeant? We're just trying to raise the Star Cloud, Colonel. Had any luck? Uh, no, sir. No contact. No contact? No, sir. Hmm. Nearly an hour since they hit the galactic barrier. I don't understand why they haven't tried to get back a message. No, sir. Neither do I. All right. I'll take over for a while. Yes, sir. Go right ahead, sir. You'd better go out and get yourself some coffee. Charlie, you look a little blue around the gills. <laughs> have just heard No Contact, an adventure in time, space, and the unknown. Dimension X. Next week, we have a nice, blood-curdling little story that starts with these two sentences. The last man alive on Earth sat alone in a room. And then... There was a knock on the door, which raises the question, what knocked on the door? Left to its own devices, the human mind supplies a vaguely horrible answer. But it wasn't so horrible, really. You'll see next week when we present Knock. Tonight, Dimension X has presented No Contact. An original story written by George Lefferts from the storyline by Lefferts and Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Captain Thorson, Lawson Zerby as Lieutenant Collier, and John McGovern as Dr. Smithson. Your host was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Tomorrow, hear Sam Spade. Now, it's Truth or Consequences on NBC. Adventures in Time and Space. Told in Future Tense. Dimension Can you predict the future 
Can you tell what will happen in a hundred years? Or in ten? Or in the next minute? Can you look beyond the known dimensions of time and space into the unknown dimension X? Tonight we have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on Earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. <laughs> Think it over. Suppose you were the last man alive on Earth. In the universe, for that matter. The last man sitting alone in a room. And suddenly, there was a knock on the door. What knocked on the door? You wonder, don't you? Your mind, faced with the unknown, supplies something vaguely horrible. But it isn't horrible, really. You'll see. The last man on Earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. Hmm? What? what? Oh, what's that? Good morning, man. What? What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Well, who are you? I am Azan. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. No, no, I, I guess I am awake. Who? What are you? I am Azan. Well, what's that? Azan is intelligent life. Why well, do What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet 7? You mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. Well, then what are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes, that is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. Well, how about the people? There is no longer any use for large numbers of lower life forms. Therefore, we have dispensed with them. Dispensed with... You mean you've... When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. Uh, what? Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh, oh, uh... Well, I, I, I'm Walter Phelan... Associate Professor of Anthropology at Nathan University. H how is it you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language. Very type of auditory communication. Oh. Is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What will you want further in your room? Well, do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. Well, then you better bring in my books, uh... uh... I gotta call you something. Do you, do you mind if I call you, uh, George? It is immaterial. All right then, George. You know, I, I can't really believe this. That is a characteristic of low life form. I'm trying to take this in without going off balance completely. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. It's all right, George. Just call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George. I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. Yes, the last man on Earth sat alone in a room. A rather peculiar room. He just noticed how peculiar it was. And he'd been studying out the reason for its peculiarity. His conclusion didn't horrify him, but it annoyed him. There was a knock on the door. Come in. Oh, hello, George. Hello, Walter. Well, what can I do for you? Point one, you will please henceforth sit with your chair pointed the other way. I thought so. That plain wall is different from the other sides, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. That's what I thought. I'm in a zoo, right? That is correct. I knew it. And if I persist in sitting with my back to it, what then? You'll kill me, I ask, hopefully? No, we will not kill you. It's too bad. George, face the bars and perform for the people. I, I mean for the Zans. 
How many other animals do you have here in the zoo, George? 216. A male and female each of 108 kinds. Male and female of... of all the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Anyone I know? Never mind. It doesn't matter anyway. Well, George, you started out with point one. I suppose there's a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. They are cold. What is wrong with them, Walter? Well, they must be dead. Dead? That means stopped. But nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Sure, they, 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 they just died. But I have told you they were alone. Nothing stopped them. George, do you mean to tell me that you don't know what natural death is? Death is when a being is killed, stopped from living. Maybe these animals just died of old age. Old age. I do not understand. George, how old are you? Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I'm still young. Now look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. Here on Earth, we've, we've got somebody that's a stranger where you come from. Down here, our people and animals live until the Grim Reaper stops them. This uh, Grim Reaper stopped the two animals? That's right. He will stop more? Oh, he gets us all, George. This is a new factor we have not considered. But you can consider it. Because when the Grim Reaper gets through, there won't be very much left of your zoo. You mean he will stop more animals soon? Well, with your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute and we'll all be gone. Oh, it looks like you made a mistake, George. I don't think there's very much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zahn is a logical being. We will take action. <laughs> Where are you taking me, George? We will be there shortly. You mean, uh, it's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble. Go inside. Uh, be careful with those books, George. Don't, don't lose... Excuse me. Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, I guess George didn't explain. George tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What is all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why. Why? You see, I, I, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart anyway. There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of a... Sort of an advanced scouting party. Yes, I saw their spaceship. It's as big as a mountain. Well, they're moving in on us. They cleaned off the Earth with some kind of vibration that destroys all sorts of animal life. They killed everybody. Oh, no. I was afraid. Well, the cheerful note is that you and I and 200-odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You know that this is a zoo, don't you? Yes. I suspected it. But I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. Well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing, shortages, wars. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, that is, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. If only they made one mistake. They overestimated us. I don't understand. They thought we were immortal. That we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can, they can be killed. But the Zans don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are more than two of us? No, no, no more of our species. The, the, these were merely brother animals. A rabbit and a canary. And by the Zans' way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece anyway. Well, it's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in their zoo. But didn't they know that we'd all die eventually? No, I don't think so. See, George told me he was 7,000 years old and he's supposed to be young. When they learned how quickly we die, well, they were probably shocked to the core, if they have cause. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment, I learned it at faculty tees. At any rate, they've decided to reorganize their zoo, two by two. Oh. Sure, they figure we'll last longer collectively, if not individually. 
But if they think... That is, if you think for one minute... No, no, don't, don't, don't worry. I don't. But are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? I'm afraid so. It's horrible. I agree with you perfectly, my dear. But all personal considerations aside, the least favor we can do the human race is to let it end with us. I don't see much point in continuing it just for an exhibition in a zoo. How can you just sit here and and lecture? Have it, have it. But we've got to do something. Why? I don't know. It, it just seems we owe it to the human race to do something. You got a suggestion? There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. You see, I, 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 I figured it out, I think. George cut his... Well, I suppose you'd call it his hand when he brought in my books. It started to bleed, red blood, but I could see the cut closing just as he stood there. And by the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Don't you see, whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zahn. They just go on and on and on until... Well, until they're stopped. Yeah. But suppose we killed one. There must be some way. Well, but what would be the use... They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put a sign out saying, Beware of the man. Dangerous. I don't think they'd have to bother in your case. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. Just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife. She died two years ago. I'm sorry. No. Not at all. Oh, that'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello. George? Hello, Walter. Point one, I have brought your books. Point one? Hmm? Well, what else is on your mind? Point two, another creature sleeps and will not wake. A small feathered one called a duck. It happens, George. I warned you. Old man, death, the grim reaper. I told you all about him. Walter, the Council of Zahn has met. It has been decided logically that the only intelligent life to escape the vibration is you. Therefore, the logical conclusion is... You are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you're off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. Are you boys afraid you're going to lose the whole zoo? It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. Now, wait a minute. This means you, Walter, and the female. Now, wait a minute, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. This is the weasel. You should have got him in the winter, George. The fur's worth more then. Then it's an ermine. This is the reptile cage. Here are the ducks. This is the male. The female has been stopped. <laughs> Lucky girl. What's the matter, fellow? You lonely down there? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. You got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us how it is done. I told you, George, I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well. We will have to take further action. Well, what are you going to do, George? We have methods of action you will know soon. We will go back now to your room. <laughs> Call me Walter. After all, George does, and we have more in common. Oh, please, what happened? Just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. What? Well, at least we can get back at them. At least we can do something to them. Well, why? After all, George isn't a bad fellow, if you like an ant mentality. How can you say that? They've wiped out the whole human race. They've murdered everybody. I suppose they have, but we can't change that now, so why think about it? Well, we can't just sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. Oh, of all the men in the world they had to pick, don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting until the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? Well, I, 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 I can't really explain, but... Walter, if there was any good in man at all, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and in the end even against himself. But at least he, he kept on fighting for what he thought was right and 
And we're all that's left. Walter, we just can't can't end it by, by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You, know, you do remind me of Martha. Oh, look, there isn't much left for us, but we could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend that there's a secret about death, and we could refuse to tell them anything. But there isn't anything to tell. Well, they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. I suppose the worst they can do is to kill us. Oh, Walter. All right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now, you will tell us how these animals are stopped? George, this may come as a great shock to you. But I've decided not to tell you. Why? Oh, call it a romantic attachment to lost causes. My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. But that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Come now, Walter. You won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight. Remember that, Walter. We've got to go out fighting. I think you're right. Come now, Walter. Goodbye. It's been a pleasure, Miss Evans. I am waiting. Come now, Walter. After you, my dear George. <laughs> You will tell us now, Walter. That was the first level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now, how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. You will tell us now? You know, George, I can't figure it out myself, but I'm stubborn. Maybe it has something to do about the dignity of man, the civilization such as it was that you wiped out. I do not understand. I didn't think you would. So go ahead. Vibrate. Vibration level two. It will be very painful, Walter. Walter? Walter? You are still conscious. Let me alone, George. You will tell us now. You will tell us how you stop the animals. Let me alone. We have had vibration levels one through ten. There are still fifteen more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, no, let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. That's tough. You better start vibrating again, George. No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. You mean you're going to let me go? That is correct. That's real nice of you, George. I, uh, I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. Oh, no, no, George, you can't do that. Why not, Walter? It is the logical plan. No, 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 she, she couldn't take it. Yes, that is what we expect. Therefore, we will go and bring the woman here. No, now listen to me, George. There is no secret. Do you understand that? There's no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. And I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. Well, I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal caged next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. The animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, no, listen, George. George, do you want... You want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped? You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you. Take me to that stopped animal, and I'll tell you how to save its mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. Walter, are you all right? Just, just... Just let me catch my breath a minute. What happened? Well, after a while, I told them what they wanted to know. You didn't? Sure. As George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. You gave up? I suppose you can call it that. Look, I'm... 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 Very... Bad. Uh, something might turn up 
Martha. Well, it's I... that they've beaten us completely, then. There isn't anything we can do except of the human race. And we give up. We don't even die fighting. Uh, you call me? Hmm? Oh, I must have said Martha. I, I, I'm sorry. The Council of the Zan has met. Something wrong? Uh, she, she was my wife. She died two years ago. What were you saying? Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. Too late. The whole... What now, George? Zahn has been stopped. What? Zahn is dead? That is correct. You didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zahn. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Oh, uh, you got it wrong, George. I didn't stop that Zahn. It's just death. It gets all of us here. You will be eliminated now. But, George, it won't do any good to kill us. It won't save you. Everything that lives on Earth must die. That is not logical. But it's true. The council has decided. This time, you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter, what did they do to you? They have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes, yes. And I... Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man. Well, there isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? Now, Walter. Wait, what's that? I have been told another Zahn has died. Now. Now will you believe me? The Council of the Zahn meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you it's old man death. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. And now what? The Council has decided this is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the Zun. Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George, and don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the Earth now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, George. <laughs> so wonderful to feel the wind and the sun again. Close the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Sure, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this grace, the Zahn leaving Earth forever. Now they're blasting off. There they go. Yes, it's over now. Well, I suppose we might as well go back in. I still don't understand, Walter. What made them go? Oh, I uh, just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no, no. No, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know at 7,000 years he was getting to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Uh, look out for the step. Well... Do you remember when the first animals died? Yes, the rabbit and the canary. Mm -hmm, and their mates just started to pine and waste away. Yes. Well, that worried the Zahn. They wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. So, finally, I broke down and told them about... affection. Affection? Mm -hmm. And then I, I introduced Donald. Donald? Who's that? There we are. Oh. Come here. Grace, I want you to meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please. What does affection have to do with it? Well, that's what the Zahn wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. That having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Mm -hmm. I even showed him how. Come here, fella. Come here. Come here. <laughs> Yes, I held Donald in my arms and petted him a while, and then then I let the Zahn take over with the 
animal in the next cage. What animal? Take a look. Hey, watch out. Don't go Water. too close. It's a rattlesnake. Yes, it's a rattlesnake. The Zahn's metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch they could be poisoned. And it was the snake that killed the two Zahn. They never even knew what bit them. And you outwitted them, Walter. I suppose. And I thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so proud of you. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought at all if you hadn't pushed me. Uh, well. Well. We've got a world to plan, a whole new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to let out of the zoo and which ones would be safer to keep in. But first, there's a much bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. Yeah, we've got to make a decision about that. It's a pretty important one. Uh, yes, uh, but... It hasn't been a bad race. Of course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but... Well, we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. Please, Walter. It's, it's the Garden of Eden. Oh, don't be ridiculous. All ridic over again. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. <laughs> Funny. Even blush like Martha. Oh, 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 only you're stronger than she was. And prettier, too. I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear, if you'll only give me a little time. Now, Walter Fairley, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that, that we... Why, I, I, I thought it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. And so, Grace, if you could only... I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going out. Well, all right, my dear, but, but think it over and, and please come back. You see, I told you. It wasn't really so horrible, our story. Remember how it goes. The last man on earth sat alone in the room. And then there was a knock on the door. Come in. Oh, come in. Come in. My dear... You see, it wasn't horrible at all. You have just heard the Frederick Brown story entitled Knock. An adventure in time, space, and the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X, 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 X. Now, about next week. Next week, we tell the story of a robot. But a robot that was almost human. Tonight's adventure in Dimension X was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Arnold Moss was heard as Walter Phelan... Louis Van Ruten as the Zahn, and Joan Alexander as Grace Evans. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Tomorrow, hear Sam Spade. Now, it's Truth or Consequences on NBC. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. Have you heard of the new science called? Cybernetics. It concerns man's efforts to develop a perfect thinking machine 
A robot electronic brain that will not only do man's work, but even do his thinking for him. A robot that is almost human. No, it's not impossible at all. In fact, one day, something like this may happen. A tall, suave gentleman in a black raincoat will walk down the street until he reaches a shuttered, isolated house. Then he will slowly mount the front steps and push the doorbell. Just a minute. I said just a minute. Hold your horses. Who do you think... Good evening, my dear. Duke. Looking lovely as ever. Can I come in, Lola? Why did you come here? Curiosity, darling. I've been thinking over what you told me at our chance meeting last week. Duke, you promised me you... I decided to come and take a look for myself. Where's the professor? In his study. Anyone else in the house? No, just the professor and I. Where's Junior? In the nursery. The nursery? Oh, quaint. And you, I take it, are Junior's nursemaid? I help the professor. Tell him he has a guest. Duke, he's a nice old guy. Tell Don't... him, darling. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, what is it, Miss Williams? Uh, Professor Blossoman, uh, a gentleman is... What? Here? I don't understand. He's waiting for you. Oh, but I gave orders. No one was to be admitted to the house. He I... insisted. Very well. Now you wait here. And I will get rid of him. Sir, what can I do for you? Professor Blossoman? Yes? How do you know my name? I've come to see Junior. Junior? <laughs> well, there must be some mistake. There are no children in this house. I don't, Professor, I don't... what you feel pressing against your belly is the muzzle of a forty-five caliber pistol. Oh. Now, shall we visit Junior? What do you know about this? I know everything. Shall we go inside? I warn you. On the contrary. I warn you. Very well. This way. This is the nursery. Where is Junior? In the next room. Uh, behind the door is the panel in it. Very considerately furnished. Mother Goose figures on the walls. Blackboard, toy blocks, panda, bunny rabbit doll. Touching. All right. Let's see him. Yeah, you can look through the panel. Oh, well. Who'd have believed it? Junior isn't very pretty, is he? Oh, I wasn't concerned with aesthetics. Why do you hide him? Is he dangerous? Oh, you see, the world is not yet ready for such a thing. Besides, I, I, I must study him. As you can see by his play, he is very young. Hardly out of the cradle. I'm educating him. With a nursery rhyme? The brain is undeveloped. It must learn its behavior patterns like any infant. Oh, come now. You call that eight-foot monster an infant? Ah, physically, of course, he will never change. He is built of chrome, steel, and glass. But his brain, oh, that is my, my wonderful instrument. Unlike a human, he has no heritage. No uh, uh, basic instinct, such as love... Oh, hate it. Well, this is none of your business. This is making it my business. Well, then in some respects, he is like a blank tablet. What is written upon the tablet will remain. You mean he has no feelings? He will learn quickly, very quickly, because his brain is not blocked by emotional considerations. Most interesting. Yes. Well, now, if your curiosity is satisfied, I... I trust you will keep my secret. If anyone discovered at this point... Open I... the door. I beg your pardon? The door. I want to see Junior in person. I almost said in the flesh. Now, look here. I, I don't know you. I don't know how you learned my secret. Only Miss Williams and the I are door, supposed... Professor. Very well. Junior. <laughs> Come here. Mm. 
What a monster. Papa? He talks? Of course. Mentally, he is now about six years old. Yes. Now, what is it, son? Who is that man, Papa? No, let me handle this. You may call me Duke, son. I've come to meet you. That's nice. Nobody ever comes to see me except Lola. Miss Williams. Do you like to play with blacks? Why, uh, yes. Nothing the Duke enjoys more than playing with blacks. Play with me, Duke? Certainly, Junior. But I don't understand what you're trying to do. Uh, Who are you? It's quite simple. I came to play with Junior. We're going to be friends, Junior and I. When I finished playing, you can have Lola... Miss Williams, prepare my room. Your room? I forgot to tell you, I've decided to stay until the climate changes and I can go out again. No, no, this has has gone far enough. You, you, you break into my home. You, you force me at, at gunpoint to open my laboratory, and then you tell me you are moving in. I won't stand for it. I'll call the police. I'm I... sure the police will be interested in Junior. Newspapers will be delighted to print your obituary, too. What do you want? I told you. I want a comfortable room, no rumpus with police. And an opportunity to play blocks with Junior. Agreed? Oh, you are hiding from the law? As you wish. Now, leave us alone, Professor. Yes, 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 I will. All right, Junior, your move. Let's build a bridge. I have a better idea, Junior. What? Let's build a coffin. A coffin? I don't know that word. I'll teach you, Junior. I can see the professor's been neglecting the moral side of your education very sadly. Lola. Oh, Lola, you're wonderful. You shouldn't have come here, Duke. Why not, my dear? You're not afraid of me. No, I'm afraid of myself. You're no good for me, Duke. You always brought me trouble. Duke, what have you been teaching that thing? Nothing, honey. I've just been playing with him. Very educational. I don't believe you. What's eating you, Lola? Today, when I walked in there, he said to me, I know how to kill people, Lola. I'll kill you if you want me to. He's learning very quickly. Oh, Duke, I'm scared of that thing. It's unholy. A machine that acts like a human. With that voice grinding at you and saying things you'd expect from a child. You dislike him so much, why did you take this job as his nursemaid? I answered an ad. I wanted to start over again. The professor didn't ask questions. I would have been all right, too, if you hadn't come along. I'm very glad you did tell me, darling. Because Junior is going to make us two very successful people. How do you figure that? You don't think I spend hours each day playing with Junior just to kill time, do you? I'm improving his mind, darling. I'm improving his mind. Like any child, Junior listens to what he's told and imitates his parents. Right now, his parents are you and me. Ha! A couple of fine examples we are. I don't know what you're teaching, Junior Duke, but I can guess. And it isn't right. It's evil. My dear, you know me better than that. What makes you think I teach a child anything evil? I never taught you anything evil, did I, darling? Well, did I? Yes. Yes, you did. Only you taught me to like it. Now, Junior, right on the blackboard... My name is Junior. My name is Junior. People are evil. People are evil. Evil must be destroyed. Evil must be destroyed. The professor is evil. The professor is evil. The professor must be... What are you doing? I warned you to keep out of the nursery, Professor. What are you teaching him? I said, get out of here. Junior, what are you doing? Go away. Junior, 
You don't even remember me, Junior. I know you. You're Professor Blossom, and you want to keep me as your slave. You didn't tell me about things, about outside. You didn't tell me that people are evil. Oh, people are not evil. Yes, they are. They must be destroyed. Oh, stop it. I'm not a child any longer. No. You are not a child, you. You are a monster. Junior. Yes, Duke? Remember your lesson. Yes, Duke. The time is now, Junior. Yes, Duke. Keep, keep away from me. Now, Junior. Yes, Duke. Junior. Junior. Junior, don't do it. Listen to me. Junior. Listen to me. I did it, Duke. Duke, I heard... Oh, horrible. Can we go away now, Duke? I don't like it here anymore. Yes, Junior, I think we're ready to go away now. Duke, why did you do it? The professor was in the way. We have to move very quickly now, Lola. We? Of course, if you don't plan to come along, just say so. I can have Junior write your name on his blackboard. Duke, you wouldn't. We'll go to Charlie's. With, with Junior? With Junior. Oh, Duke, you can't. I'm afraid. Relax, my dear. I have great plans for you two. Wouldn't you like to be independently wealthy for the rest of your life? The only way you get that way is by inheriting a million. Not when you have a fellow like Junior around. Duke. Junior is mine. He obeys me. What you might call a mechanical stooge. I'm still afraid of him. Lola, Junior wouldn't hurt you. You wouldn't hurt Lola, would you, Junior? You remember what I told you about Lola? You like Lola, don't you, Junior? Oh, yes. I like Lola. She's pretty. You see? Junior's growing up. He thinks you're pretty. Just a wolf in steel clothing, eh, Junior? She's pretty. All right, we're wasting time. Okay, Junior, mesh gears. We're stepping out into the big, wide world. Sit down, Charlie. Yeah. Sure, Duke. Lola and I are going to hide out here for a while. We'll need some help. Listen, Duke, I'm I'm trying to keep the cops away. You wouldn't refuse the Duke your hospitality, would you, Charlie? Why, it ain't that, Duke. Good. Now listen to me. I need a casing job done. Casing job? You know the armored truck service? Yeah, yeah, sure. I want to know when they take the Acme deposits from Boston to Worcester. Well, Duke, you ain't thinking of a payroll truck, are you? They got, they got cannons on those trucks. They travel in pairs. You couldn't get near one of them. I asked you to do a casing job, Charlie. Yeah, sure, Duke. Anything you say. Well, I wonder what time they passed the narrowest and most deserted stretch of road. Uh, if you're going to pull a job like that, you'll need 50 men. You want me to get some of the boys? I won't need anybody. I've got somebody. Where? He's out in the car. What's his name, Duke? Anybody I know? His name is Junior. I don't know any Junior. <laughs> you will, Charlie. You will. Spoke, Sam. Oh, thanks, Al. Oh, it sure gets hot in these armored trucks. Hey, you get used to it after you've been driving one for 15 years like I have. How much are we hauling this time? About two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, brother. Could I use a hunk of that? <laughs> yeah, who couldn't? Well, I'll be coming into Wooster any minute now. It's almost midnight. Yeah, what's our first stop? Acme National Bank. Then we unload a payroll at the Bronson Watch Plant. Yeah, I wish we could open a window and get some fresh air. Well, we can get that after we unload. It's a rule of the company that we. What's that up ahead? Looks like something shiny in the road. Throw up your spotlight. Right. Holy smoke. You see what I see? Looks like a mechanical traffic cop. About eight feet tall. Yeah, standing right in the middle of the highway. Uh, it must be a Halloween gag. Can you get past him? I don't know. We'll have to slow down. Get on that gun, Sam. Let's take no chances. All right. 
I'll give it the horn. It don't budge. Where's our escort truck? It's pulled up right behind us. Thing won't move. Sure looks like something out of Buck Rogers, doesn't it? This is a heck of a note blocking traffic like that. Well, we'll have to try and get past it. It looks like you might squeeze by on the shoulder. Here it goes. Holy smokes, it's moving. It's coming toward us. Get on that gun. Give it a blast. The bullets are bouncing right off it. It's still coming. Look at the eyes. Al, back up. I can't. The other truck's right behind me. Al! It's lifting its arm. Al's gonna smash our window! I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Duke, we we got to quit this. What's the matter, Charlie? Getting shaky? Oh, you know me, Duke. Takes nerve. Charlie's always been right there. But this, uh, the papers say he killed all four drivers. Listen, Duke, that, that, that robot is hot. We got to get rid of it. Stop your blubbering. I don't mind a little heist, but, but killing four guys. You know, it... Charlie, for a fat man, you certainly have a slim mind. You want to take a lesson from Junior. He doesn't worry. He doesn't even know what a policeman is. He has no conscience. He never sleeps. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't even want a share of the profits. All we need is one more good robbery. You ain't gonna pull another one. Why not? Count me out, Duke. You have to lamb out of here with Lola and, and that thing there. I'm getting too jumpy. The law's gonna track that baby. Are you quite finished, Charlie? You got no heart, Duke. You're like Junior. All steel inside. And you're just a big warm-hearted slob. Well, I, I, I got nerves. I, I can't stand the thing. The way it looks at you with that iron face and the clanking around it. Hello, Junior. Hello, Duke. I've just been talking to Charlie. Yes, Duke? You know what I think, Junior? What, Duke? I think Charlie's yellow. You know what happens to people who turn yellow, don't you? Yes, Duke. Tell Charlie. They're evil. We have to destroy them. You see, Charlie? Junior has a sense of values. He doesn't like people who sing to the police. Now, Duke, now, Duke, wait a minute. You know I never turned studio on anything like that. I never sang to the coppers in my life. But you'll sing to Junior, won't you, Charlie? What? Sing Junior a nursery rhyme. What, what do you mean, Duke? You heard me. Sing Junior a nursery rhyme. Maybe Little Bo Peep. Junior likes Little Bo Peep. Duke. Sing it. What? Little Bo Peep has... Duke, listen to me. I, I, I didn't... Bring it, Charlie. You can stay here as long as you like, Duke. You too, Junior. You see, Junior? He's yellow. Sing it, Charlie. Hello, Bo Peep has lost his sheep. And can't tell where to find them. Junior? Yes, Duke? Leave them alone. Now. And they'll... Now, Duke. Now, Junior. And they'll come home. <laughs> Duke! I stopped him, Duke. All right, Junior. Clean him up. Take him down the cellar. Duke, I was in the other room and... <gasps> Charlie! Oh, Junior, put him down. Take him down to the furnace, Junior. <sighs> yes, Duke. Oh, Duke. Duke, you can't... Relax, darling. Stop shaking. Oh, Duke, we can't stay here now. No? We've got to get out of here. Charlie's going to be missed. He's got friends. Now we'll have the gangs after us, too. Stop worrying, darling. I'll take care of everything. Where are you going? Out to a travel agency. You and I are going to take a trip, Lola. You leaving me alone? Nothing to worry about. The roadhouse downstairs is closed. Nobody will bother you. Oh, that doesn't frighten me. It's it being alone with that thing. I've got the jitters, too. It'll only be for the afternoon. I've got to get reservations and plan this thing. Look, honey. 48 hours, you and I will be on our way to Switzerland with $500,000 worth of loot. What about Junior? Junior will be taken care of. Pity I have to do it. I'd kind of like to send him out on his own. Why not? He has a fine education. He could go out into... Stop it. How can you get rid of him? Junior will do anything I say. So I'll merely have him get into the furnace and sit there while I fill it with oil and set fire to it. Too bad the professor couldn't have stayed around to see him growing up. He's almost a man now, Junior is. But not quite as clever as a man. (laughs) 
<laughs> You'll find that out after he steps into the furnace. All right. But do it now, Duke. Before you leave. There's no time now. Keep your chin up. I'll be back about eight. Duke, you... You are coming back, aren't you? You wouldn't leave me. Leave you? I have big plans for you, Lola. You see... I find you very... attractive. You're not good for me. I don't want you. As long as you can tell yourself you're not really kissing me because you want to, why not enjoy it? I know you, Lola. Yeah. You know, too much for one man. And I'm going now. It'll be nice to join you while I'm gone. Don't show him you're afraid of him. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Duke. Lola? What, Junior? Lola? Oil me. Duke might not like it. Can't you wait till he gets back? I want you to oil me, Lola. All right. I like you to oil me. Yes, Junior. Are we going away from here, Lola? Yes, we're going away. That'll be nice. I don't like it here. I want to see more things. I want to see a roller coaster. Where'd you hear about a roller coaster? I read about it in a book. Charlie gave me a book. No. Will Duke let me ride on a roller coaster? I don't know. Maybe. You like Duke, Lola? Why, why certainly. Do you like me? <laughs> you know I do, Junior. Lola? What? Who do you like best? Me or Duke? I like you both, Junior. Yes. But who do you love? What do you know about love? In the books, man and woman love. Oh. Lola? Yes? Do you think anyone will ever love me? I'm different. I'm a robot. You want somebody to love you, Junior? I want something, Lola. I guess that's what I want. It's very lonesome being a robot. Do you think it makes a difference? I think some women can fall in love with anything, Junior. Even with a man like Duke. Why, Lola? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because, well, as long as she thinks her man is the smartest and the strongest. Oh... Where are you going? To wait for Duke. Oh, he won't be home for a while. I'll sit in the hall and wait for him. All right, Junior. I want to be alone and think. How about what? I read in a book today it was bad to kill people. What does that mean? Bad? Bad? I don't know, Junior. Guess it's just a word. <laughs> Lola? Hello, Duke. Oh, it's you. What are you doing sitting in the dark? I was waiting for you, Duke. Oh, that's a good boy, Junior. Duke? Lola oiled me. Well, that's nice. Tell him what, Junior. I've got a little job for us down in the cellar. Let's go down there. Now, Duke? Right now, Junior. All right, Duke. Are we going away soon? Yes, Junior, we're going away. What's in the cellar, Duke? A little surprise for you, Junior. You'll find out. Is that you? Junior. 
Hello, Lola. I saw I heard Duke come in. He came in. Where, where is he? Down in the cellar. What's he doing? Nothing. Did he say he'd be up soon? No. Maybe you'd better go down and get him. He's dead. Oh, no. Oh, he's dead. You said the woman loves the strongest oh. and the smartest. Well, I'm stronger and I'm smarter. Oh, but, but you're human. I'm almost human, Lola. No. Oh, stay away. Lola. Oh, those metal hands. Don't touch me! I love you, Lola. No! I love you. No! I love you. The last thing I she love heard you. was the robot's I harsh voice droning it I over and over again. I love you. And strangely enough, it did sound almost human. You have just heard the Robert Block story titled Almost Human, another adventure into the unknown world of the future, the world of Dimension (laughs) Next week, a strange story of other worlds. The story of the lost race. Tonight's adventure in Dimension X was adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Santos Ortega as Duke, Rita Lynn as Lola, and Jackie Grimes as Junior. Your host was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. During the months to come, General Mills has planned to bring radio listeners an excitingly new half-hour show each weekday evening. Two of these shows have already joined the Wheaties Big Parade. On Mondays, it's Night Beat, and on Wednesdays, you'll hear Dangerous Assignment. More to come in the Wheaties Big Parade of NBC shows will be Sarah's Private Eye, Dimension X, and the Texas Rangers. You'll hear all of them in the Wheaties Big Parade of NBC shows. Hear the Phil Harris's tomorrow, now Truth or Consequences, on NBC. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. When man first crossed the vast distances of outer space to land on strange worlds, he found that someone had been there before him. The ruined canals of Mars, the smashed cities of Titan and Centaurus II and III, all these were evidence that 100,000 years ago, a race of intelligent beings built their cities across the galaxy. They knew space travel, Atomic power, astrophysics, and engineering. And then they destroyed themselves. Completely. So that of all the cities on a thousand worlds, only dust and rubble remained. Why? Why did these beings obliterate all record of themselves? That 
is the mystery of the lost race. The freighter Carilia, bound out of Earth for Cetus Alpha 2, came into normal flight after 103 days in overdrive. The stars were unfamiliar. The constellations known on Earth had disappeared. But there was a yellow sun off to port, and about it revolved three planets. What do you make of it, Briggs? It isn't on any of the star charts, Captain Wharton. I checked through. One and three are dead, all right. Have to take a closer look at number two. Turn up the vision scale. Hmm, polar ice caps. She's green around the belt. Let's take her down to a five-mile orbit. Swing around her for a look. Alert for deceleration. Aye, sir. Throw in the manuals. Power room. Power room, aye. We're going down to have a look at something. Give us just enough power to keep her under control. All right, Briggs. Hang on to your stomach. You sent for me, Captain Morton? Come in, Mr. Howell. I... Do you mind if I sit down? Free fall sickness? Well, I'm afraid I'm not an old space hand. Oof. We'll level out in a minute. Do you want something? Yes. We come out of overdrive, smack in the middle of a new planetary system. Briggs says it's unreported. Well, that's rather good news, isn't it? Depends. Press report's pretty common. But we'll stake a claim on her, in case there are any mineral discoveries. Well, I meant the possibility of archaeological finds. I'm afraid I'll leave that to you, Mr. Howell. You're the expert. Coming up five, Captain. Level off. Hang on, Howell. Power room. Hold her steady, she goes. We'll orbit at slow cruising speed. All right. Clear the scope, Briggs. Aye, sir. Hmm, nice-looking piece of real estate. Well, the space guard requires I check up for radioactives, gold, and lost race rooms. You're landing? Landing. I've got a schedule to keep, Mr. Howe. I can't sit down on every lump of dirt I run into. We'll do a spectroscope check, and I figured you'd spot any ruins. All right. Wait a minute. Hmm? There in the lower quadrant. What? That bald spot in the vegetation. Those are ruins, all right. Are you sure, How? Yes. I've seen the lost race rubble on Centaurus, too. There. You can see it plainly, dust and rubble. Oh, that's what I get for calling in an expert. Briggs, stand by to take it down to 5,000 feet. Aye, sir. All this stinking luck. There goes my schedule. <laughs> Seen enough, Howell? It's going to set me back five hours. Interesting. Wait a minute. What's wrong? I, I don't believe it. Marvelous. Incredible. Stop sputtering, Howell. What is it? Look over that rise in the ground. It's hmm? a section of the city still standing. Hey, you're right. That hill must have shielded it from the blast. Captain, you've got to land. Land? You've got to. This is the first lost race site that's ever been spotted, of course. You'll land. Howell, we get a thousand dollar bonus for every day under par for the run. But you don't understand. It's the biggest find in the century. We can chart it, and you'll have to get back somehow. But... That's all. I'm not sitting down to rake over old dust heaps. Captain Wharton, I'm on commission to the Space Guard. You may have to answer to them. I'll think up one. Look, Howell, strictly speaking, you're a passenger. Well, you've got you to land. You don't belong on the bridge. I'm not landing down there unless. Not... Freaks! Emergency from the power room. Something must have blown. Power room. Power room. Danton, what's wrong down there? Danton! He doesn't answer. Anything serious, Captain? Reaches the fuel locker. That five pounds of ascending will go and kick us right out of space. Danton! Danton! Power room, I. What happened? What blew? The main tube coupling. She's secured What's now. the damage? The main tube's burnt out. The bearing, the coupling, the injector valve, and the needle gauge. Can you make repairs? Not in flight. Can you raise enough power to land? I don't know, Captain. The wiring shot. He's flat like a tomcat. I might be able to get something from the deceleration auxiliaries. Get a jury rig on her. We'll try to set her down. Aye, sir. Briggs. Yes, sir. Alert for crash landing. <coughs> Signal room. Signal room. Signal, I. Langston, get off a position fix and SOS standby. Aye, sir. Well, Mr. Howell, I guess you're going to join your friends in the lost race. I just hope it's not permanently. Level 
leveled off now, Captain. Turn her up a point. That's it. Shh. She's bucking bad. Five more minutes and the whole place will shake loose. Power room. Stand by for bar blast on signal. All ready. Got to try for that clearing. Too narrow. Two to one for a dollar. All right. Hang on. What? Bridge. Bridge. Oh, you all right? I hit on the panel. Well, I seem to be all, all assembled. Well, we're down. Guess our luck hasn't run out yet. Calling power room. Power room, right. All right down there? Yeah, I'm all right. Stanton, I want a complete damage check and repair estimate. Get up here as soon as you got it for me. Briggs, you all right now? Yes, sir, I guess so. As soon as we get Dan's report, get a detail aft. Help him with repairs. Captain Wharton. What is it, Langston? My speaker line's out. Sending circuits blew. Spare tubes? Uh, that was a pretty rough landing, Captain. They're gone. I can't replace them this side of Lunar Space Station. I see. Well, the SOS ought to do it. And the Space Guard Monitor reports up They aren't with... going to, Captain. Why not? Sending circuits went out when the blast went off down there. I didn't get the SOS out. Thank you, Langston. Get back and see what you can salvage. Does that mean bad news? We were in overdrive, Mr. Howell. It would take 40 years to search the distance we've traveled in one day. Consequently, when a ship doesn't make port and doesn't transmit a position fix, they forget about it. Oh. I see. And with the radio out, we blast off on our own power. Or we don't get off. I got your damage report, Captain. Well... Here, it's on a B-23 checklist. Mm. Not bad? Worse. Stanton, uh, how long will it take you for repairs? I don't know. An estimate. I know gypsy fortune teller. How about the lifeboat? For deep space? What are they teaching at Sands Point now? Basket weaving? Stanton, Lifeboat I... couldn't lift half a light year off this here mud heap. Stanton, I'll take just so much... Can it be converted to Bessendium Drive? The converter links were mashed when we came down. How long is it going to take you to repair the main drive? Look, Captain, I got two hands. You want me to hold a lug wrench in my teeth? See here, Captain. You stay here, Captain. The whole lousy crew's been spitting all over me ever since we blasted off. Now you can all wait on me. Who do you think you are, Captain? The only power man on this ship, that's who. Can't satisfy with the way I'm working. Go hire yourself another boy. The woods are lousy with him. I'll take my own sweet time. What's the matter with him? Got a bug in his ear? Space fatigue, Captain. He's been locked up in the power room four days. Oh, we don't have enough trouble. Briggs, remind me to slug the psychotechnician when we get back. Don't tell me nobody gets into deep space who isn't emotionally stable. What are you going to do about him, Captain? Nothing. Stay off his back. Oh, but you can't... Captain's the only man who can get us out of here. We want to hit the cradle at New York Spaceport again. We've got to keep him happy. Captain Wharton, as long as we're landed and we do have to wait for the engines to be fixed, I suppose we can explore the lost race ruins. I'm Look, Mr. Howell, I can't spare the men. We are now stuck tight until Danton gets those engines fixed. And if he can't, which is entirely possible, we are stuck, period. Oh. Oh. Briggs. I want you to keep a careful eye on the men. Space fatigue is nothing compared to what we might run up against now. Captain Wharton. Captain, I've got it. The sending circuits? No, uh, no, sir, but I picked up the incoming video band. Well, that's something. Uh, can you get the mail call through? The men could use a little lift right now. Well, the scheduled one-way personals are due at 2330 Greenwich. Good. That ought to help morale. Langston, uh, rig the receiving booth. Aye, sir. How? Oh, this is a break. Seeing the folks at home may be enough to keep everybody on an even keel. I know I'll be glad to see that kid of mine. No, no. Yeah. Mr. Langston, get Hanson out of the booth. You wear the glass right off the tube. Ah, take it easy, Williams. Everybody gets three minutes. Hey, Kelly, I bet that dame of yours burned up the circuits, huh? How'd you know it was his girl? You can't tell through the booth. Well, who else would call that eight? What'd you say, mm. Kelly? Oh, nothing. She don't have to. 
She just stands in front of the pickup tube and, oh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see that. Hey, hey, it's a boy. A boy. Alice had a boy. What? They're going to show him to me in the circuit tomorrow. Congratulations. <laughs> 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 Who's next, Mr. Langston? Uh, the last call's coming through now on ticker. It's for Williams. Well, hey, wait a minute, Williams. Hey, let go of my arm. What yeah. happened to my call? Uh, no call today, Dan. You're a liar, Langston. Hey. My girl calls in every scheduled circuit. That must be mine. Now let go, Dad. Maybe Janie was busy waiting tables in the lunchroom. What do you know about her, Hanson? You kidding? She's a swell kid. Everybody at New York Spaceport knows her. Yeah, I've yeah. seen you hanging around Jane, too. Now, wait a minute, Dan. Take it easy, Dan. You and Williams made this up between you, didn't you? You're going to take my call, huh, William? You're space happy. You used to hang around with her before I cut you out. Now, listen, Dan, you were lucky enough to get her. Let well enough alone. You bet I got her, all right, and you're not going to steal her back. Williams, I'm going to... Are you crazy, Dan? Get him off of me! Lion. Get him off! Hey, what's, what's it? going on in here? Let him fight! I'm you, you double crush him! Behind my back! Grab him, Hanson, get his arm. Oh, me! Nobody took that call. Calm down, Dad. Right I'll fix all of Look out. He's got a wrench. Stand him! He's nuts! Ah, nobody gets a call. Nobody. How do you like that, Williams? You ain't gonna hear from Janie no more. How do you like that? After him! Kelly! Hanson! The airlock. He's left the ship. Let him go, the jealous screwball. Sure. But that's the only man who can get us off of here. I warned you, so help me, Briggs. I warned you to keep an eye on Damp. Well, I didn't think he'd go off this way. Well, it's that girl of his, sir. He's crazy jealous about her. Any reason for it, Williams? No, sir. She's a good kid. Too good for Dan. I guess he's just so afraid of losing her to some other guy, he, he's getting psychopathic about it. Well, we've got to get him back. I want every man equipped and ready for search parties immediately. Aye, sir. Williams, rig some portable searchlights and issue hand blasters and radiation tickers. Kelly. Aye, sir. You had the second party. If you find Danton, send up a signal flare. Aye, sir. Unless we do find him, we'll be on this planet until the next freighter stumbles on us. Maybe 10,000 years from now. <laughs> That light up, Hanson. This is amazing, Captain. Lost Ray's building's actually standing. Hey! What is it? Oh, it's nothing. A shadow. This place gives me the willies. To be able to find out so much about them, their science, art, what they looked like, perhaps even why they destroyed themselves. I'm beginning to wonder about that, How? You sure they destroyed themselves? Maybe they lost a war to another race. Uh, the winners would have left traces. Genghis Khan, the Mongol emperor, left a pile of skulls as a monument after he destroyed his enemies. But there's been nothing like that found. No clues at all, eh? Nothing. When they decided to wipe themselves out, they did a thorough job. But why? That's what we've been asking for 50 years. They wanted to end like that. Captain, there's a rise of it. Keep going. Anything on your side, Briggs? No, sir. Handsome, what is it? I don't know, sir. It's a funny kind of a glow. I guess I shot without thinking. Don't no, get trigger happy. Howell. Yes? Where do you think the light is coming from? Down there. It's an amphitheater. Stone seats and a hood. It looks like a band shell. What's up, Captain? Wait a minute. Well, Howell? I don't know. That's the lost race sign on the hood. The what? A sort of hieroglyphic. The only thing we'd ever found before. One in each ruin. What does it mean? Some kind of a warning, I think. Come on. We're going down there. Careful now. There's a platform of some kind down there. Looks like a lecture platform, doesn't it? Or an altar. This might have been a temple. Perhaps the Lost Race sign had a religious significance. It looks like a throne to me. A throne five feet high. Briggs, climb up there. And see if there are any controls for this machinery. Hi, sir. This wasn't meant for any man to sit on. There's a lever up here. Shall I try it? Sure, go ahead. Hey, what the... What's that mist? It's like a steam bath. I wonder if Kelly and Williams ran into hey, anything Kelly, like... Hold that light up. Shut up and keep looking for Danton. What? Look there. In the hood. It's Williams and Kelly. That crazy jet jockey. When I find Please, him, I'm going to beat his brains out. You could see him. A 
three-dimensional image. Some kind of television. Get down, Briggs. Aye, sir. Did you see it, Skipper? I was just thinking about him, and there he was. And we all saw it. Out of the way. I'm going to try it. This thing can pick up Earth. It'll replace the receiver. Danton smashed. Just throw the lever, eh? What? That's my son. I'll be darned. His music lesson. Say, it reaches Earth, all right. What? Imagine. Television without a transmitter. Looks like the lost race was ahead of us in more ways than one. Go up and try it, Howell. It's amazing, amazing. Television without a transmitter. This, this machine may be the clue to the mystery of the lost race. I'll try it. Mary, I've told you I like my paper first in the morning. What? If that youngster wants to know how the tigers did, let him wait until I am... My father in Detroit. Remarkable, Captain. You can see the whole room clearly. Say, how about me, Captain? Let me get up there. I like to see my baby. Alice told me all about it. Ow! What's the matter, Hanson? I kicked something, a wrench. Well, hold it up. What? It's Danton's. That means he's been here. We're on his trail, all right. Come on, Hal, let's go. Oh, but the baby wouldn't take a minute, Captain. Later, you... Hanson. We've got to find Danton first. All right, now, let's get moving. Hold it. What's that? The recall flare. Kelly and his men have found Danton. Oh, I hope that crazy fool is in one piece. We start back now, Captain. Yes. That came from the ship. Another flare? No, that was an explosion. That's all we need now. Something more to happen to the ship. Oh, it's the main jets. Smashed flat. Of all the sleeping rot. Check through the ship for further damage. Aye, sir. Hold on, look at those plates. Crumpled like an accordion. Captain! Oh, Captain! Here comes Kelly's party. We got him. We got Danton. Hold it. What, what happened here? Somebody blew up the main jets. Danton, do you know anything about this? No, sir. Not much, he doesn't. He's crazy enough to blow us all up. Listen, Hanson, I admit I went off my head tonight, but I'm not crazy enough to commit suicide. The jets are smashed. We're all marooned up the same creek. I still think he's got something to do with it. Lay off, Hanson. We found him wandering up in the hills. And he was with us when the blast went off. Yes, that's right. We saw your recall flare before the explosions. Oh, I guess that puts Danton on the clear. Well, then who did it, Captain? I don't know, how. Looks like somebody didn't want us to leave this planet. Well, we still got one slim chance left. If we can repair the lifeboat... Skipper, it's gone. Gone? The escape port is open, the boat's missing. What? Oh, what else? The arms chest was cleaned out, sir, and the fuel locker was jimmied open. The Sendium bars are gone. You sure? You can look for yourself, sir. She's clean. I see. There's only one answer left. There's something or somebody out in those ruins trying to get us. Maybe that lost race decided they weren't going to stay lost. You think some of them may, may still be alive? Who else could have blown up our ship? Master up, Hal. And be careful. It's a hair trigger. What are we doing back at the television machine, Captain? I thought we were looking for the lifeboat. We are. Whoever blew up the ship must be around here. Might as well try to use the machine to track them down. Yeah. Yeah. Catch them with their own gadget, huh? That's right. All right, Hal, you're the expert. Get up there and try to find them. I hope it works. Well? I'm trying, Captain. Nothing but mist. I don't understand it. It reached all the way to Earth before I saw my father in Detroit. Mary, my paper's all rumpled again. What? There it is again. My father in Detroit. I've told him time and time again, I don't like a messy paper. Look at that. No selector control, yet all the way to Earth. You can see the whole room, the goldfish bowl, the, the antimacassars on the chairs. Yet we can't pick up something less than a mile away. Knock it off, Hal. We're wasting time. Come on. That gadget won't work. We'll have to comb these rooms inch by inch. I don't understand. Neither do I. We'll cut behind the hood here and go on. Briggs, you take the lead with the radiation ticker. We might be able to pick up a reading on where the rocket fuel is hidden. Aye, sir. All right, let's go. 
can't understand why that machine can pick up birds and not... Captain, help! Captain! Briggs, what is it? Captain, help! I'm falling! It's a cave-in. Hang on, Briggs. I'm slipping, Captain. <coughs> Grab his wrist. All right. Now Got pull. It. Pull. Uh, higher. Higher. Uh, higher. Oh. What happened? Huh. I was just walking along and the ground caved in. What? It's some kind of shaft. Hold your light over it, Captain. Oh! Fifty feet deep in a stone bottom... I could have split my head open like a grapefruit. Something down there. Hold that light steady. Amazing. Amazing. Looks like a pile of bones to me. Two piles. They may be the first skeletal remains ever found of the lost race. I've got to get down in there. We haven't got time, Howell. Come on. Let me have your binoculars. Wonderful. That small skeleton must be an infant. They've been laid out carefully at the burial chamber. The way they're lying, it's probably a mother and infant. Yeah? The tail, she's definitely anthropoid. Howell, you... you mean apes? Something like that. Yet they had atomic power and built cities across the galaxy. Amazing. Howell, we haven't got time. Hello, that's funny. The, the little one is different. The, the caudal bones are different. No tail. Listen, Howell. What do I care whether they had tails or not? Come on, now. It's almost as if... Well, they, they, they did have atomics, and radiation does funny things to heredity. They had that problem of mutations in Detroit. What? Detroit? That must be it. What? The new atomics plant at Detroit. They tore down my father's house to make room for it. Quickly, Captain. Oh, where are you going? Back to the machine. I've got a theory that may solve the whole mystery of what happened to the lost race. I don't care what happened to the dead ones, Howell. I want to find the living ones who wrecked my ship. I think this machine may give us both answers. There's the house, Detroit, down to the last detail. Oh, come on, Don. We know all but that. But don't you understand? That house was torn down. I got a letter before we lifted off Earth. It's gone. But it's on the television machine. Captain, that machine isn't television. It's a thought projector. What? It only mirrors what's in your own mind. But, Mr. Howell, we saw Earth. It was really there. But it was just because we imagined it, Briggs. It's a thought projection. I can produce any mental image that occurs to me on this machine. New York spaceport, a space guard patrol, anything. Anything? Yes. And now I think I know what inspired the lost race to do what they did. It was fear. Fear of what was in their own minds. They could all see it with machines like this. But fear, fear of what? They foresaw the future. So they destroyed themselves. Every last one of them. All it, how. Are you sure they're all dead? 100,000 years ago. Then who blew up the ship and stole our lifeboat? Danton. Danton? But why? He was pathologically jealous. Yes, but blowing up the ship was like committing suicide. He wasn't crazy enough to do that. The lost race was after they looked at this machine. You mean Danton did too? We found his wrench here. You're right. He must have looked at the machine and thought it was television. He must have seen all his fears about losing his girl confirmed. That was enough to make him completely unbalanced. But he was with Kelly when that explosion went off. He's got an ironclad alibi. No, he hasn't. It wouldn't take a power man long to sneak back to the ship and rig a delayed action fuse. Howell, we've got to get back to the ship before Danton. Never mind, Captain. Stay right there. That's Danton. You're in the dark. You make a perfect target there. Stop your gun. I got a blaster set at wide angle. Drop him. He's got his cold. I've been following you, Warden. I wanted to tell you, I'm going back to Earth. I got the lifeboat hidden over that rise. It won't work in deep space. <laughs> you believe me when I told you that, didn't you? Well, I've got it fixed. And with that percentium fuel, it'll be a milk run. I'll reach the space guard station at Volta with a long, sad story about how the rest of you exploded in mid-space. Danton, that's murder. Yeah, yeah, that's just what it is. And easy, too. Danton, you can't just leave us here. Watch me. Sit in front of that machine and watch me. Yeah, I know what it is. I know it's a television without a transmitter. And I did some checking up. I've seen how you were stealing my call. Trying to steal my girl. Stanton, you're sick. You Pretty can't... Pretty smart, that lost race. They built some machine. And it showed me plenty. It showed me enough to kill you. Oh, you've got it all wrong. This isn't a television machine. What are you trying to pull, Warden? I saw it. Those were your own thoughts, Stanton. Those things you saw exist only in your mind. Shut up before I blast all of you, Don. You're just trying to lie out of it, that's all. But I know the truth when I see it. And you're going to die. All right, Danton, but you're not going to get away with it. Look at the machine. 
Oh, what's that? The machine. It's the space guard patrol, Dan. And look, they're coming. X-3 to command. Spotted the Corellias reported. Preparing to land. That's the space guard, Danton. Yeah, whole patrol. You're lying, you're lying. They couldn't come. There wasn't any SOS. X-3 to command. Preparing to land. There's a clearing. That's enough, Howell. <laughs> All right, Danton. They'll be coming over the horizon. Drop your gun and give yourself up. Oh, no. No, they're not going to catch me. I'll be away in that lifeboat before they land. Stand still, all of you. Stay where you are. I Danton. still got you covered. Danton, look out behind you. Ah! Burial shaft. He fell in it. Hold the light down, Briggs. Well? He's dead. Deader than the lost race. And what about those space guard cruisers? Out of my head. I just imagined them. And there they were on the machine. Poor Danton believed they were real. I wish they were real so we could get off this planet. No, it doesn't matter. We know where the lifeboat is now. We can send one man to bring back help. And it won't be Danton. The machine got him the same way it got the lost race. Through fear. But what was the lost race afraid of, Howell? Changing. Changing? Look at those skeletons down there. They had atomic energy, but they couldn't control it. Look, the baby is different from the other. The race was changing by mutation. Mutation? Look at those skeletons. Now imagine a shifted hip socket so they could walk upright. The baby was already without a tail. But how? That would mean they were changing into... Into... Yes, Captain. The lost race committed suicide rather than face the fear of seeing their descendants become such horrible creatures as men. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. And now, about next week, William Travis and his wife thought they had escaped. But they were wrong. They were being searched out by men from another world. Men who wanted them to return. Where? I'll tell you next week. Tonight's drama was based on the Murray Leinster story, The Lost, and was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Features in the cast were Matt Crowley as Captain Wharton, Roger DeCoven as Howell, and Joseph Julian as Danton. Your host was Norman Rose. Tomorrow, it's Sam Spade. Now hear Truth or Consequences on NBC. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. Time is an interesting phenomenon. A ticking clock the running sands of an hourglass. All these have captured the imagination of men. But time is more. It exists now, and then, and in the future. Suppose we are in the year 1950. Coexistent in time may be worlds we have never seen, the worlds of the past and of the future. The year was 1950. It was a spring night in Mexico, fiesta time. The fireworks shot up into the clear, dark sky, and a paper mache bull ran about the plaza chasing boys and laughing men. Mr. and Mrs. William Travis stood on the edge of the yelling crowd, smiling. Oh, what is it, Bill? What are they saying? They're cheering for the bull. 
Here he comes. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> He's good, isn't he? I wonder how they rigged up that fire for Oh, anything. Phil, it's wonderful. <laughs> I've never enjoyed myself so much in my life. It's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> well, they brought the bull. Bravo, Toro. Bravo, Toro. <laughs> oh, we'll go on, won't we? I mean, I'm kidding. Ah, oh, Sue, don't worry. I've enough traveler's checks for a lifetime. Relax. Let's suppose they find us. Forget it. Uh, they haven't a chance. But suppose they do. Suppose they take us back. They'll never find us now. Relax. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> oh, it could only last. Come on, darling. Let's get out of the crowd. I think you'll need a drink. <laughs> All right. Let's try something different this time. I want to try every drink there is in the world. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, darling. There's no rush. We've plenty of time now. All right, in here. All right. Oh, there's a table over there. Come on. Bill. Hmm? What's the matter? Don't... Don't look right away, but over your left shoulder, right by the end of the bar, that man... What is it? I saw him this morning in the plaza. Well, darling, take it easy. The town is full of tourists. But he was at Juarez in Tasco. Bill, I'm afraid. Well, now, don't stare at him. Come on. I know it's the same man. He was wearing the same white suit. Sit down, Sue. All right, now, come on, dear. Smile. Act natural. Bill, he's been following us. He's a searcher. I know he is. Quiet. Oh, a boy. Here, boy. Si, senor. Si. Uh, Benedictine and brandy. Two. Two. Si. Si, senor. He's watching us, Bill. Oh, you quit worrying, darling. The chances are one in a thousand that they found us. Probably it's just a coincidence. I... I want to lie down. I think I'm going to be sick. Oh, Susan, hang on, will you? If he is looking for us, we can't run out. What's he doing now? He stopped our waiter. He's asking him something. He may just want a drink. Bill, I can't stand it. I've got to go upstairs and lie down. All right, all right. As soon as we finish our drinks. What's he doing now? Well, he... He's nodding at me. Oh. As if he knows me. And he's smiling. Bill, he's coming over here. Now watch yourself. We've got to go right on in front of him. It's what he is, what we think he is. He won't suspect... I couldn't. We've got to. Now, come on. So I said to David, I said, Dave, that's ridiculous. You know that the thing is that is never going to take... Kristen. What? You did not pull up your pants leg when you sat down. Oh, well, I'm afraid you have the wrong person. My name isn't Chrysler. Chris Ten. No, well, I'm William Travis. I don't see what my pants leg has got to do with it. Mind if I sit down? Well, we well can... yes, I... Everyone nowadays pulls up his pants leg when he sits down. Like this. Keeps the trousers from bagging at the knees. <laughs> but, of course, if you're not used to this style of clothing... Now, see here. We don't know you. We, we don't... don't? I'm sorry. I thought I knew you. Look, this is our table. If you don't uh, mind... You see, I'm looking for two friends of mine. A man and his wife. Very much like you. The man is an atomic scientist. The wife, a bacteriologist. Very important people. They work on government business. Just what are you talking about? When I find my friends... Going to take them home with me. Look here, Mr. Uh... Sims. That will do for now. All right, Sims. I understand that you thought you knew us. But you can see you're mistaken. Now, if you'll excuse us, my wife and I were just going up to our room. We have to make an early start in the morning. Going for a trip? Up Aca Acapulco, perhaps? Lovely Never spot. mind where we're going. Yes, yes, of course. You don't like crowds, tourists. I'd probably like to get off the beaten path. You know, I've got a vacation folder here that might interest Please, you. Please, uh, Bill, let's go. Oh, wait, Sue. Put out by an outfit that calls itself Travel in Time Incorporated. Travel in Time? Yes, they've come up with a rather intriguing idea. Would you like to actually witness the burning of Rome? Sail with Columbus in 1492 on his voyage of discovery to America? Meet Cleopatra? Then why not take your vacation in time as well as in place? Uh, but, uh... Perhaps you've seen this leaflet before. Of course not. Then you'll be interested in hearing the rest. Travel in Time Incorporated can cost you, you put you in the crowd at any place and time in history. Look, we I... guarantee to teach you any language you need to move freely in any year without risk of detection. This summer, why not escape from the worries of our modern world? Take your vacation in time. Oh, that's impossible, of course. Ah, but think what it would mean. 
A chance to escape all the tensions of an unpleasant life. War, insecurity, fear. Sims, I... Suppose you were a scientist working on a dangerous bomb project. Oh, you, uh, Mrs. Travis. Suppose you were a bacteriologist working on disease cultures. And you had a chance to escape all that. To take a vacation 200 years in the past. <laughs> Would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Escape to a more peaceful world. A trip back to, uh, 1950. 1950? But you said a vacation in the past. So I did. But you see, 1950 is the past if you come from the year 2155. 2155? Mm-hmm. Terrible times. Most unpleasant. A war raging, an atomic bacteriological war. I Terrible times. With none of the little comforts we enjoy today, like this fine Havana cigar. Bill, I... I want to go upstairs. I want to lie down. If you were living then, think of how wonderful it would be to take a vacation in time. Back to now. Oh, you're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. Suppose a young couple like yourselves took a trip to 1950 and didn't want to come back. You know what would happen? The government sends a searcher back to look for them. This is all fantastic nonsense. A searcher finds them and brings them back. Well, do you think I'll find my two friends, Mr. Travis? Bill, please take me upstairs. I don't feel well. Oh, is the lady feeling a bit sick? How oh, unfortunate. Here are the drinks, senor. Well, shall we drink a toast to 2155? To the future. Inside, quick. Bill, what are you doing? Like shoving a chair into the doorknob. He knows. He has been following us. Bill, he's a searcher. You keep quiet, Sue. I want to think. Bill, take us back. That isn't over yet. Oh, I've got a headache. Uh, I'll get you an aspirin. What will they do to us? I don't know what they'll do to us. Something slipped. Something must have slipped. But we were so careful. Well, the searchers are trained to watch for detail. Things like not pulling up my trousers. That started him thinking. There is a man who isn't used to ancient clothes. Could kill myself for giving it away. No. It was my walk. These hot oh, heels. careful now. Here. Thank you. Bill, I won't go back. I won't go on filling tubes with typhoid and bubonic plague. Now, take it easy, sir. There must be some way... We don't have to go back to 2155, do we? The nerve of that sim sitting there looking us up and down like animals smoking those stinking cigars. That's how I first noticed him at Tasco. He had four bottles of liqueurs and a pile of chocolate. Yes, well, he still hasn't gotten over that first greedy hunger. We've got to look out for that suit. It's the sure sign of somebody from the future trying to make up for a lifetime of shortages by stuffing themselves sick. Remember our first night? Bill, I can't stand it. We've got to get out of here. What are you doing? Packing. Getting the suitcase out. That's no use, well, Sue. What do you mean? We can get to Acapulco by morning. Don't you think he's watching us? We could get away. No, no. We've got to sit tight. We've got to wait right here for a break. I don't know what, but something has got to break. <laughs> Darling. <laughs> Darling, I'm afraid. No, no, no. Maybe he isn't sure of us yet. Maybe we can still figure out some way to escape. Come on, now. We better try to get some sleep. <sighs> Go back. Security police. The bomb. The bomb. It's falling. It's falling. Sue, Sue, no. what's the matter? Sue. No, no. Sue, 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 wake up, darling. Bill, Sue, Bill, wake up. Where are we? Shh, all Bill. right, all right. Now calm down, honey. You were dreaming now. It's all right. Bill, where are we? Now, now we're still in 1950. Oh. It's all right. You must have had a nightmare. We, it was... It was awful, Bill. Bill, there was an explosion, a terrible explosion, and my hand burned and wrinkled, and the buildings broke. Oh, Bill. Bill, we won't go back there, will we? Ever. No, 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 no. Go to sleep, honey. It's all right. We're in Mexico, 1950. And we're going to stay here. 
Bill. Bill. Sue. I've been lying awake here thinking. It may be that he's still testing us. That he's not absolutely certain. That may be why he hasn't moved. Well, maybe, maybe he's just playing with us. Yes, maybe. I wouldn't put that past him either. He's got all the time in the world. He can stay here as long as he likes, then bring us back to the future 60 seconds after we left it. They, they can't make a scene, can they? They don't dare come out in the open. No, no, no. That might change the future. They're afraid of that. Oh, Bill. If we could only tell somebody, ask for help. Oh, Sue, you know we can't. That's why we had to submit to the psychological block treatment before they okayed our vacation. <laughs> we couldn't tell if we tried. The block is too strong. Oh, maybe we can break it, Bill. And what if we did? Who'd believe a crazy story like ours? Who would believe that we come from 2155? No, Sue, that would do no good. But this is important. They have to get us alone to put us in the time machine to send us back. Well, then, then that's it. We'll never be alone. <laughs> Listen, it's still fiesta time. It'll be easy to stay in the crowd. Yes. Yes, that's our only chance. <laughs> we must not let him get us alone. He won't get us back to that war and that insane world of it. Bill. It could be the room clerk. At three in the morning? I'd better answer it. No, don't. Don't, Bill, don't. I've got to. Hello? Hello? Mr... Travis? What is the idea of this? It's three in the morning. Yes, yes. I just wanted to remind you, the rabbits may hide in the forest, but a fox can always find them. What was it, Bill? Bill? No, never mind, Alan. Come on. Let's get some sleep. Why, we can. <laughs> Senor? Good morning, Senor Gomez. I trust you are spending pleasant days in my hotel. Yes, yes the time is the best. Oh, it's, it, it's been lovely. Your special table is all ready for breakfast. Oh, fine. Wait, blazes in the hotel. Hey, you bust away the hotel in this country. Yeah. What is all that racket? Oh, great excitement, very great. Oh, boy, what is it? Well, they come with uh, four trucks and innumerable automobiles. A motion picture company from Hollywood. Oh, what are they doing down here? Well, they make pictures of our fiesta for the, the uh, backgrounds. Oh, yes. We have a very beautiful town. Beautiful. <laughs> yes, very beautiful. That, uh, that that fat man, the one with the most colorful shirt, he is the, the chief, the director. Manager, oh, yes. manager, where's the manager of this Adobe flea bag? Coming, senor, coming. You will excuse me. Oh, I hope the table is satisfactory. Yes. Coming, senor, coming. Sue, this is a break. That movie company will draw crowds, and that helps but us. But when can we leave, Bill? Well, not today. We'd be sure then. It'd be easy to catch us above on the road. We better stay and try to lull sins. Okay, kids, end of the line. Ciao. Get it up, Buster. Lay out the pepper. I got no There's Sims, Bill. Where's the dining room? Well, we can't do anything now. Look at these actors coming in. Okay, follow me, kiddies. Hey, Gloria, you sit next to Papa. Hey, Max, make sure nobody monkeys with the trucks and the gear. Right, Chief? Do we have to eat at this crummy joint, Joe? Cheer up, sweetie. Your mere presence makes this chastens and the truck rolled into one. <gasps> Not this early in the morning, Joe. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> okay. Isn't that it happy, you don't you? Is on the Look, Susan. Oh, Maybe I could hire two of them. I could say it was a joke. Oh, why? We could dress them in our clothes, have them drive off in our car sometime when Sims couldn't see their faces. Where would that get us? Well, with him off on their trail, we might make it to Mexico City. It'd take years to find us there. Shh, Bill. That movie man's coming over here. Oh, excuse me. You folks are Americans, aren't you? Yes, that's right. Boy, am I glad to see you. Yeah, I'm so sick of hearing Spanish, I could kiss you. <laughs> hey, come on over and eat with us, huh? Oh, well, I, I don't think we should intrude. Yeah. Come on, come on. Misery loves company. You're, I'm misery, and that's the company. We're from Hollywood. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I understand. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the boy would I like to be there now. We're down here for some preliminary shots on some technicolor clam bake, you know. <laughs> Real turkey, stinkeroo. Oh, that, that's too bad. But we've got an expense account. Oh, that's a lovely thing. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm Joe Melton. I'm the unit director. Oh, well, I'm William Travis. This is my wife, Susan. Hi. Mutual. Oh, come over, kids. Join the party. Cheer us up. Only no tamales. I burned out three kidneys on tamales since I came over the border. <laughs> hey, hey, am, am I funny? Oh, wonderful. Oh, come on over. Hey, Kitty. Yeah? I got new blood here, brother. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh. Just a moment, Mr. Travis. I thought you might be breakfasting with me. Alone. Sorry. Oh, no, I got him first, Mac. Do you want to join us? Uh, no, no, I've already ordered. Mr. Travis, I think you'd better talk with me now. Hey, is this guy giving you trouble? It's all right. Well, you say the word. I'll have Max pitch him out on his ear. No, 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 it's all right. Uh, we'll be right over, Mr. Melton. Oh, Bill. We'll talk to Mr. Sims. Uh, Mr. Melton, uh, sort of keep an eye on us, huh? After all, you found us first. Yeah, sure. Well, come on over soon, kids. Hey, Charlie, you sure took it. Sit down, Mr. Travis. I hope you slept well. Did you? I'm not used to spring mattresses. But there are compensations. I stayed up half the night trying new cigarettes and foods. <laughs> A whole new spectrum of sensation. <laughs> well, what are you talking about? <laughs> Still acting, huh? But it's no use. You can't stay in crowds all the time. I'll get you alone soon enough. I'm immensely patient. Let's come to the point. It took me a month to trace you down and be sure of you. Now, if you come with me quietly, I might be able to get you off with no punishment. If you agree to go back to work on the bacteria bar. We don't know what you're talking about. Stop it. Use your intelligence. You know, we can't let you get away with this escape. Other people in the year 2155 might get the same idea and do the same. We need people. To fight your war. Bill. It's all right, Susan. We can talk on his terms now. He's got us. We can't escape. <sighs> At last. Really, you've both been incredibly romantic. Running away from your responsibilities. Running away from horror? Nonsense. Only a war. Only? With half the world dead, the other half dying? Yes. But we can't have you escaping here while we drop off a cliff. Dying people love to know that others died with hey, them. Hey, kids, break it up. We're waiting on you. The longer you keep me waiting, the harder it will go on you. What do you mean? We need you on that bomb project. Return now and no torture. Torture? Yes. You see, later we'll force you to work. And after you finish the bomb, we'll uh, try a number of complicated new devices on you. Bill. As you say, you can't escape. We have all the time in the world, here in 1950. Sims, I'll make a deal with you. I'll come back now, if my wife stays here alive, safe, away from that war. No, Bill, Keep no. quiet, sir. Well, Sims, you need me for that bomb. You can duplicate her work. It exceeds my authority, but all right. Meet me in the plaza in ten minutes. I'll pick you up in the car. Good. We'll drive out into the country to some deserted spot, and I'll have the time travel machine pick us up. Bill, I won't let you. Don't argue, Sue. It's settled. Good. I'll meet you in the plaza in ten minutes. Your wife may stay here as long as she wishes. All right, Sims. It's a deal. Don't try anything now, Travis. I know when I'm licked. We just want a few minutes to say goodbye. I'll be seeing you then. Bill, I won't let you do it. I won't let you. Please, Susan. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to get help. You can't. The psychological block It's won't... our last chance, hey, Bill. Hey, hey, aren't you two going to join us? I thought Mr. You... Melton, I've got something to tell you, and you've got to believe me. Sue, it won't work. I've got to try. Go ahead, kids. Spill it. You've got to understand. You see, we really... Ah, uh, uh, Bill. Bill, my head, I... I can't think, but my, my, See, my you head, need a my promo, head. honey. It can't work, Sue. Now, the block oh, is too strong. Come on, we'd better get the car. Hey, someone's head. crying. Now, breakfast, no time for people to cry. Now, what in the world could a good-looking kid like you find to cry about? <laughs> I won't 
let you do it. Don't make it harder, I'll Susan. I'll let me go back with you. We'll get through some way. You think I'm going to let you go back to that war? <laughs> Sue, please stop. We haven't got much time. It was so wonderful here, Bill. Oh, Bill. And there he is. <laughs> smoking those cigars of his, waiting for us. Oh, man. There must be some way, some way that we can both stay here. Maybe there is. Bill! Bill, what are you going to do? Hang on, Sue, and duck when I tell you. No! No, Bill, you're heading right for him. I'm not going to get either of us now. Oh. Uh, down, Sue, down! Down! No. It's all right, darling. It's all over now. This is the mayor, dear. Signora, your husband has been officially cleared in this most unfortunate affair. It is obvious this uh, Senor Sims died of an unavoidable accident. An accident? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, adieu, Senor. Senora. Adios. Will they want to see you again? No, 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 no. I'm clear. I lost control of the car. That's the way it stands. Oh, Sue, I hated to kill him. I never wanted to do anything like that in my life. Where will we go now? Mexico City? Well, the car's in the repair shop. It won't be ready till four. Then we'll get out of here. Hey there, Travis. Wait up. It's the movie man, Bill. Oh. He was very good to me when they had you in there. Oh? Hey, I heard what happened. They sprung him. Oh, great. Yeah, great. It, it was an accident. Well, it's lucky you didn't get hurt yourselves. Everything okay now? Yes. Yes, I think so. Oh, that's fine, but you both look a little rocky. So you want to get your mind off your troubles? We're through for the day. Clouds fouled up our shooting schedule, so we're going to put a header on it up at the hotel. Well, I don't, I don't think we'd better. Well, you've got to wait till your car's fixed, don't you? Oh, come on now. It'll do you good to relax. It'll get your mind off what's happened. Gloria's cracking the ice now. Well, maybe we will join you. I've got to go check up on the car and well, then... Well, don't miss the party, kiddies. I'll see you upstairs. Bill, I, I don't think oh, we... Oh, come on, honey. We've got the break now. Sims is dead. Before they can put another searcher on our trail, we'll have time to make a clean getaway. Bill, I'm, I'm so tired. I know. And what you need is a little excitement. We raid a celebration, honey. <laughs> well, I... I guess it would be nice to unwind. Sure. We'll go up to Melton's room, have a couple of drinks and a few laughs. Honey, it's all over. <laughs> we can relax. Kitties. Well, we thought we'd join you, Mr. Melton. Oh, great, great. Call me Joe. Hey, Gloria, yank another cork. We got company. Well, here you are, kids. <laughs> Thank, oh, you. Thank you. You kids raid a drink. That was a pretty messy business, but it's all over now, huh? Yes, it's all over. Yes, well, it's time to unlax. Grab a glass, honey. Oh, thank you. Hey, hey, quiet, everybody. Quiet, quiet. How about a toast to our guests? Oh, sure, you bet. All right. To a very beautiful lady, lovely enough for the movies. Oh, what? Oh, thank you. No, I'm not kidding. That's why I came over to you in the first place. I might even give you a test. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean it, honey. You're pretty nice. I, I could make you a movie star. Oh, and take me to uh, Hollywood? Well, at least to get us out of Mexico. No, you're not serious. Sure I am. Uh, uh, Gloria, how about a refill? Coming out. Well, it sounds wonderful, doesn't it, Bill? Uh, yes. Uh, Los Angeles is a pretty crowded city, isn't it? Crowded? Wait till you see the sunset bus. No, you don't really think I could be an actress. You don't have to cheer me up anymore. I'm feeling wonderful now. No, I'm serious. I think you'd be great. <laughs> I want to do a suspense story. Sort of a war story, you know. Uh, Gloria, pour Mr. Travis another glass. Okay, huh? Joe. Uh, a suspense story? Yes, dear, yes. A story about a man and a wife who live in a little house. Now, I'm just ad living this, you understand. Oh, yeah, sure. Go on. But there's a war out, see? A terrible war, you see? They live in the year 2155. Now, here's the gimmick. They escape into the past, and they kill a man who follows them to bring them back. Uh, Gloria, honeypot, get Mr. Travis another glass. Well, sir, this couple takes refuge with a group of movie people, 
the safety in numbers, they figure. Bill. Bill. Ah, but the story goes on. This couple is terribly important for a new project. Uh, let's call it a bacteria bomb. So the searchers figure out a way that they can get them alone in a hotel room. Shove a chair under the door now, Max. Yes, sir. You see, the workers, searchers may work alone or in groups, so that if one of them's killed, the rest carry on. Don't you think that would make a wonderful picture, huh, Susan? Don't you, Bill? You're not going to get us, Melton. Stand still. Put that gun down, Travis. Hey, Who is it? The manager. Your guy. Right, grab that gun, Max. Sit down. Let go of me. He's not made go. things worse, Mr. Travis. Bill. The manager. He heard us. Let's get going. Let go of me. Let go. He'll break down the door in a minute. Max, get ready to travel. Get that. Take a good look, Mr. Travis. Take a good look at 1950. You won't be seeing it anymore. Throw the switch. <laughs> All right, Juan, break down the door. Uh, where are they? I was at the door. I heard them inside. They're gone. The windows. Oh, the iron bars are undisturbed. What, what happened to them, Juan? They, they just disappeared, all of them. Nuestro Padre Chiel. All right, Juan, pray later. Senor, I think you'd better send for the priest in Hollywood. Later, later, Juan. Hey, that just disappeared. Look here in the closet. See? Si? Hey, bottles, hundreds of bottles. Hey, Shot rolls, si. cognac, absinthe, tequila, Turkish cigarettes, and boxes of pure Havana cigars. These crazy Americanos. Why should anyone leave all this behind? Juan? Never question providence. There is enough here to last us both for a month. Juan, I think we can look forward to a most happy future. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. Now, about next week, suppose that you were a private detective and into your office walked a strange-looking client. Would you believe him if he told you that there was a Martian embassy hidden somewhere in New York? where spies from the Martian planet were preparing for the invasion of Earth? We'll tell you about it next week. Tonight's adventure in Dimension X was the Ray Bradbury story To the Future, as adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. John Larkin was heard as Bill, and Jan Miner as Susan. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Don Abbott. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Tomorrow it's High Adventure, now it's Truth or Consequences on NBC. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension... Out of the infinitude of stars and planets in the solar system and other systems in the universe, it is almost mathematically certain that there exist other forms of life on other worlds. Someday, in the future, in a thousand years, or in the next ten minutes, daring travelers through space will make contact with the inhabitants of another world. But the question is, will we contact them first, or will they contact us? Come in. This is Broderick's private detective agency. Check. My name is Graphius. Graphius of Springfield. 
I would like to see you, Mr. Broderick. Check. What is it, Dolan? There's a guy outside. A kind of a guy? Oh, a great big guy with a big shining head and thick glasses like the bottoms of Coca-Cola bottles. A- and he looks like a professor or what something. What I mean is, does he look like a client or a bill collector? He didn't say. Okay, Iron Man, send him in. Check. Mr. Graffius, Mr. Broderick will see you. Thank you. Mr. Broderick? In the flesh. Okay, Iron Man, step outside. Check. If you need me, I'll be outside. I'll have to excuse Mr. Doolin. He's a very useful man if you happen to want a house moved or somebody's head unscrewed from their shoulders. His reflexes aren't too good. Hmm. He's what you might call underorganized. I suspected as much. All right, Mr. Graffius, let's get down to business. Precisely. I would like your assistance in having me locate something here in New York City. Just what are you trying to locate, Mr. Graffius? The Martian Embassy. Would you say that again very slowly? I came to New York to locate the Martian Embassy. Martian? Like in Buck Rogers? Precisely. Agents of the government of the planet of Mars. Dolan! What's the trouble, boss? Come out, he's a crackpot. Of course, if you wish me to leave, I will leave. But before I go, you might examine this. You'll find it quite authentic. Holy mackerel. A five-century note. Let me see that. Uh, sit down, Mr. Graffius. Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Dolan, get Mr. Graffius a light. Check. Okay, Mr. Graffius. Your remarks about our speckled friends, the Martians, I shall ignore. This being the year 1955, I assume you were joking. On the contrary, I'm completely serious. As it happens, I'm interested only in Martians at the moment. I see. Okay, uh, shoot. It occurred to me in the course of my studies that we Earth people cannot possibly be the only intelligent form of life in the universe. Out of the infinitude of stars and planets... There must definitely, mathematically, be others. Since Mars is older geologically, and since it is also an atmospheric planet, its evolutionary history could easily be similar to ours, you follow me? Well, so far, I can't say no. But if this is true, then they must have been watching us, observing us, for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. What for, blackmail? Shut up, Dolan. They know, then that we are not far from achieving space travel. Atomic rocket ships that can travel to other planets. They also know we're a militaristic, warlike race. We might conceivably set out to conquer and occupy Mars one day. In which case, they'd uh, try to get the jump on it. Uh, Precisely, Mr. Rodriguez. And how would they do that? For a civilization as old as theirs, space travel would be a simple enough matter. Flying saucers. I read about it. Relax, Iron Man. Go on, Mr. Graffius. If you were planning to attack an unknown nation, what would be your first move, Mr. Broderick? Intelligence. Find out what the odds are. You have a very logical mind, sir. You would send agents to scout the nerve centers of earthly civilization and advancement. Not in Kansas City or equatorial Africa, my dear sir, but here in New York City. The most technically advanced spot on Earth. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, you want me to help you prove this theory of yours? Precisely. Expense does not interest me. Well, this may take a very long, long time, Mr. Graffius. After all, nobody's ever seen a Martian. I assure you, they will be very ordinary-appearing people. Very likely they live together in downtown New York, close to the newspapers and publishers... The news cables, communication centers, and the financial center of Wall Street. Most certainly, they live in a private house with no servants to pry into their affairs. Some ordinary people who live in a private house in downtown New York. Yes. I might just as well look up Martians in the classified section of the phone book. (laughs) There is one other lead which might help you. What's that? They would be almost certain to subscribe to every conceivable type of newspaper, scientific journal, foreign language publication. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that might be something. 
Okay, Mr. Graffius. It's a deal. Excellent. I shall contact you tomorrow. Oh, uh, before you leave. Yes? Just as a matter of interest. Why are you so interested in meeting up with these Martians? Mr. Broderick, I wish to avert the catastrophe of a successful Martian invasion of the Earth. Naturally. I cannot go to the police or the military. I'd be laughed out of existence. So I'm doing this privately. You seem to know all the answers, Mr. Graffius. Not all of them, Mr. Broderick. Not quite all the answers. Not quite yet. Hey, boss. Here's a private address. Takes everything from Pick Magazine to the Manchester Guardian. Listen to this. Pick, Look, Scientific America, The Daily News, The Daily Worker, The Police Gazette, The Journal of Engineering, Scientific Quarterly, American Psychiatric Journal. Let me see that. Oh, Doolan. Doolan, sometimes I wonder. What's the address on this? 9 West 124th Street. Which happens to be the Harlem branch of the public library. Oh. Now listen, Noodle Brain. Check all the renting agents. Find out every private house in downtown New York. And then cross-check with the magazine subscription departments of the scientific magazines. You got that? Check. I wonder. Boss, what's the sense of all this? We know there ain't no Martian embassy in New York. This crackpot is paying us $100 a day and we got to keep him happy. You understand? Yeah. Also, I've got a hunch that Mr. Graffius isn't looking for any Martian embassies. He's looking for something quite different. I'll start making with a telephone. Which house is it, Dolan? Right down there. Number 108. Did you find out anything? Not a thing. I've been watching the place for a week now. Nobody comes out, nobody goes in. I asked around. Nobody knows nothing. You ain't been blabbing around the neighborhood that we're looking for the Martian embassy, have you? Boss, uh, I'm stupid. But I ain't that stupid. Who'd you talk to? I struck up what you might call a casual acquaintanceship with those two girls standing with the baby carriages up the street. The cute one is real cute. Mm. Now look, Doolin. Don't try to do anything intelligent. Just keep walking up and down. See? Check. I'm going back to the office to meet Graffius. See you later, boss. Hiya, beautiful. Hiya, Flatfoot. How did you know I was a detective? Your socks are bagging at the arches. <laughs> <laughs> well, stick around, beautiful. I'll be back in a few minutes. And we can make some beautiful music together. <laughs> Listen to Romeo, Helen. The name is Dolan, honey. Iron Man Dolan. Your line is getting rusty, Iron Man. What do you want to fool around with him for? He reminds me of my husband. He's a big, good-natured slob. Helen. Helen, look. Oh, oh, hey, Dolan! Dolan, look out! Look out! Helen? Waiting, Mr. Graffius. Not at all. Sure. Uh, Doolin found a house down in Greenwich Village, privately rented. Number 108 Conklin Street. Nobody seems to know anything about who lives there, except that they subscribe to every paper and scientific journal put out. And also, they have a peculiar antenna on the roof. You don't suppose your Mr. Doolin will try to get inside the house? No, he knows better. Mr. Broderick, I assure you, if that place is the Martian embassy... Doolin can take care of himself. Still, I wish you had informed me before. Well, that's probably him reporting back now. Excuse me. Hello? Yeah, speaking. Doolin? Yeah, he works. What? Oh, no. No, I can't think of any. Yeah, sure, okay. Yeah, I'll be right down. Okay, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, right away. Something the matter? Doolin is dead, Mr. Graffius. What? 
They found him splattered all over the sidewalk in front of number 108 Conklin Street. How? How did it happen? There were some witnesses. They said a building cornice dropped on him. The cornice? But how? It fell off the building next to 108, right on top of him. Come on, we can get a cab. I have to identify the body. Lieutenant, I'm Broderick. Oh, I'll lay your boy, Broderick. Not very pretty. Oh, mother in heaven. That's a thousand pound hunk of concrete. Where did it come from? Dropped off the roof of 106. Anybody see it? Yes, a couple of maids pushing baby carriages. One was so shaken, we had to send her to the hospital. The other one is hysterical, but she can talk. Can't seem to get any sense out of her, though. Do you mind if I talk to her? Not at all. I'll be back in a minute, Graffius. I'll wait here. She's standing right over there with the patrolman on the beat. Uh, oh, Hanson. Yes, sir? This guy wants a few questions for the girl. Please. I told you what I saw. How many times I gotta tell you? Yes, the dead man was a personal friend of mine. Would you tell me what happened, please? <laughs> Helen and I were standing in front of Raffman's candy store up on the corner. We both had the babies up. I worked for Mrs. Gillian on Washington Square North. This he he said hello and joked a little. Then he walked down the street just like he's been doing all week. Hadn't taken more than a few steps, but what Please, miss. Oh, it's I, very important. I tell them, but they don't believe me. What do you tell them? How it happened. Tell me. It's too awful. Please. Well, well, first he squashed, and then the stone fell on him. What do you mean, he squashed? They don't believe me, but Helen saw it, too. She saw what? First, he squashed. Then it fell on him. He was mashed flat before it even hit him. Now, look, that's the story, Broderick. Please, please, let me alone. Let me go home. I told you what I saw. Now, let me alone. Let me alone. Did you learn anything, Mr. Broderick? Huh? I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. It's crazy. Mr. Broderick, if I may make a suggestion at this point, perhaps it would be better if we dropped the entire matter. What's eating you? First you come at me with a chain of nonsense that you're staking real cash on. And now when we hit solid trail, you want to call off the dogs. Well, maybe you operate that way, but Broderick doesn't. May I ask, then, what do you intend doing? As soon as the cops clear out and this place quiets down, I'm going to pay a personal call on the Martian embassy. Whatever number 108 is. <laughs> Heads or ten fingers, I'll drill you like a platoon of rookies. Yes? Oh. Well, young man. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Is the lady of the house at home? I'm the lady of the house. Well, uh, my name is Broderick. Uh, I represent the Manhattan Child Adoption Center. We're soliciting funds and clothing for stranded and unadopted children. I wondered oh, if... Oh, won't you come inside? Well, we don't usually... Oh, nonsense. I'm old enough to be your grandmother. Besides, my son, Lauren, is working at home. Your son? He's a bibliographer. He writes summaries of articles and books from scientific journals and publications for libraries and universities. I see. <laughs> well, sit down, Mr. Broderick. We get so few calls, and I do like to visit. Oh, thank you. <sighs> now... What was it you wanted to talk to us about? Oh, well, uh, I, uh, I wondered if you or your son, there's nobody else living here. No, just Lauren and I. I'll have to ask him about the contribution, but I'm sure he'd like to. Good. Uh, thank you very much. I'll send a representative to collect. Oh, please, stay a moment. I was just about to have tea. Let me pour you a cup. Oh, no, thanks, really. Uh... No, young man, I insist. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was getting awfully tired of having tea by myself every afternoon. You know, I'm 
not very much of a tea drinker, but this seems to have a strange taste. It's my own recipe. The secret is in the brewing. <sighs> it's sweet. It almost... Metallic. It takes a few sips to get used to, like olives. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I think I'd better be running along. Oh, but you haven't finished your tea, Mr. Broderick. I'd better be going. I'm late. Oh, you're not being very polite. Do finish your tea. No, really, I feel funny. Oh, I'll call Lauren. No, no, I'm leaving. you I'm dizzy. Oh, I'm sure Lauren can help you. I'll call him. Oh, no, don't oh, bother. But I must, besides, you aren't well. Gee. Lauren! Get out. Lauren, Lauren, hurry. Got it out of my way. No, you must stay. Yes, I drug my teeth. Let go of my arm. Lauren! Let go. Oh. Got to get out of here. What heaven? The other one, that Broderick, he was here. I drugged his teeth. He got away. Fool, idiot. Go after him. Use the pressure ray. Risk another murder on our doorstep. Are you insane? But he suspects. We'll have to take our chances. We'll have to think of some other way. How did they find us? I don't know how, but I'm certain someone else sent them. Who? I don't know. I'm afraid to let myself think. It might be... them. Please, I... Get away I... from me. Uh, stay awake, me. Look out. Miss, please. Let go of me. I... Help. Please. Help, officer. You don't understand. What's the trouble here? This drunkard is insulting people. I saw him come out of that house there. 108? That's the one. He bumped into a gentleman, and then he pulled at my arm. All right, miss. I'll take care of it. Come along, mister. I'm going to give you a break and take you back to the wife and kids. No, no, you can't. I'm sick. Sick, is it? What's the matter? Drugged. They drugged me. Who drugged you? Number 108. Martians. Who? Martians. Number 108. It's a Martian embassy. Well, I've seen them with pink elephants, rabbits, and mice, but you're the first one who's got Martians. That's true, I tell you. Uh Uh-huh. Come along. Now, listen, listen. Don't take me back there. Don't kill me. Look, I gotta make you understand. Here, here. I'll help you up the steps. Please, my name is Broderick. I'm a private dick. We'll find out about this. Here, don't try it. <laughs> Officer, please listen. I'll give you anything. I'll give you a thousand dollars. Please listen. For God's sake, listen. Listen. Yes, Officer. Why, Broderick. Uh, you know this lush granny? Why, that's my son, Broderick. <laughs> no, no. Martian. He's in pretty bad shape. Better get him to bed. Oh, dear. He was doing so well at the Alcoholic Society. He must have gotten off again. Looks like he's ready to pass out. Lauren! Lauren! What is it, Mother? Oh. Your brother, Broderick, has been drinking oh, again. Yes. Look out, he's passed out. I'll take care of him, officer. We've handled this sort of thing before. Can you manage okay? We'll be fine, thank you. You've been very kind, officer. Oh, nothing at all, Granny. I know how it is with these alkies. Well, I'll be seeing you. Oh, Mr. Broderick is regaining consciousness, what? Mother. What happened? <coughs> oh, I can't get up. Do not struggle, Mr. Broderick. <coughs> It'll be impossible for you to rise from that chair. The pressure from this ray will keep you there. Ray? What? Who are you? You've already guessed, Mr. Broderick. You mean this really is the... Martian Embassy, yes. You have the honor to be the first prisoner of the Imperial Government of Mars. First prisoner? Yes. After the invasion, of course, you will all be our prisoners. Hey, look. What sort of a business is this? No business, Mr. Broderick, as your people will soon find out. Our preparations for invasion are nearly completed now. As soon as we give the signal, our armed forces will launch a surprise attack. And then the Earth will be ours. You're crazy. Not half as mad as you, Mr. Broderick, to come muddling so foolishly into our affairs. That was a fatal mistake. So Doolin's death 
It was no accident, then. Assuredly not. We found it necessary to use a pressure ray on your friend. The block of concrete was an afterthought. We thought it might help to avert suspicion. All right. What happens now? If you cooperate, you can look forward to a quick, painless death like your friend, Mr. Doolan. If not? This pressure ray has many delicate adjustments. It can move a pin, or it can crush a boulder. Let me demonstrate. You see, Mr. Broderick, as if an invisible vice were crushing you. What do you want? The name of your client... We are interested in knowing who is so anxious to locate the Martian embassy. The names of my clients are confidential. Oh, well. All right, all right. right. Turn it off, Mother. Mr. Broderick has seen the wisdom of speech. His name is Graphius. Graphius? Yeah. An unusual name for an Earthman. Describe him. Well, I don't... No, if I really can. Mother. Describe him. He's tall. He's got a big forehead. And about 60. He wears thick glasses. He's bald. Lawrence. Sounds like one of them. Yes, it does. Contact the planet. Tell them we suspect that our plans are known. Ask for an acceleration of invasion day. At once. What about me? I am sorry, Mr. Broderick, but I am afraid you know too much now. In exactly five seconds, you will feel the full impact of the ray which faces you. I would suggest that you relax and meet your fate calmly. Now, wait a minute. You will feel no pain, just a wall of force engulfing you. Listen, I... Five. No, you can't do this. It isn't human. I know, but we are not human. Three. Yeah, but... Two. No. One. Mother in heaven. Now. Lauren. It didn't work. Something's happened. The magnetic field is dead. Get it working. We've got to get rid of this one. Now, listen. Listen, you two can't understand what's gone wrong with the ray. Why would it suddenly stop like that? Perhaps I can explain. What? Graphius! It's you! Yes. Lauren! Stand back from the pressure ray, please. It will not function anyway. I have decontrolled your field. Lauren, it's one of them. They found us. Did you think we wouldn't? I trust you have not harmed my friend, Mr. Broderick. He's been very useful to me. Brother, am I very glad to see you... Talk about the Marines landing in the nick of time. You're free to move now, Mr. Broderick. I don't know how you got in here, Graphius, but stick around. These babies are really Martians, just like you said. They're planning to invade the Earth and take over. There will be no Martian invasion. You keep these characters covered. I'll get the police. There will be no need for the police. I intend to handle them myself. Yeah, but the police will... You will not call the police. Why not? You fool of an Earthling. Don't you realize with whom you are dealing... The invasion of Earth by Mars will be like child's plague compared to... Oh, Lauren! Holy mackerel. They just flattened out. Like your friend, Mr. Doolan. I detest the use of violence where the intellect can rule. But unfortunately, the Martians are a threat to us. It must be destroyed. I believe you now. Another five seconds, they'd have finished me. I'm glad you didn't waste any time. There is little time to waste. The Martian invasion was to have taken place next week. Yeah, I... Hey. They never said that. How do you know? You would not comprehend. Wait a minute. There are some things here I do understand. A second ago, that pressure ray didn't work. Now you're using it like it was a toy. How did you get in here anyway? Who are you? Another one of those Martians? No, Mr. Broderick. I happen to be a Venusian. What? A representative of the planet Venus. Venus? That's impossible. Not at all. The Martians are really an inferior race. We Venusians are much farther advanced. As much as we are over you, Mr. Broderick, the Martians would simply have conquered and enslaved your people. We Venusians felt compelled to exterminate you completely. That's impossible. Oh, no. Now that we have disposed of the Martian threat, what is there to stop us? Our invasion begins tomorrow at noon. By nightfall, the Earth will be ours. Brother in heaven. Either I'm completely cuckoo or... Oh, 
Oh, well, this is really on the level. You needn't edge toward the door, Mr. Broderick. You're thinking of running for help, aren't you now? I can read your thoughts quite clearly. Suppose you're going to knock me off like our Martian friends. On the contrary. Go ahead. Leave? Why not? Why don't you try it, Mr. Broderick? Because the minute I turn my back, you're going to let me have it. Suppose you try it and see. I have no interest in stopping you. Go ahead. All right, Buster, you ask for it. It will do you no good. No good! You will see! Let me go. Here, here, why do you think you're running the truck? Hey, officer, officer, listen to me. Oh, it's you, the one with the marsh. Yeah, that's right. Now, listen, that story is true. They're inside that house, inside number 108. He killed them. Who killed? Graphius. He's the leader of the Venusian invasion. Venusian invasion? That's right. Tomorrow at noon, they're going to take over the earth. Now, listen, go in that house. Martians, now Venusians, eh? Okay, that's enough for me. Come along. Good, good. We haven't got much time. Now, hey, wait. Where are you taking me? Bellevue Psychiatric Ward, my friend. Come Bellevue, on. Bellevue, no! No, come on. No, why don't you listen to me? Why are you such a fool? Let go of me. Here, Rooney is a bed bug. Come no! on. I tell you, there's going to be an invasion. The Venusians are going to invade us. Don't you understand? you got to believe me. You gotta believe me! Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> oh, why don't they listen? Why don't they believe me? You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future, the world of Dimension X. Next week, the story of Riesling, the strange blind singer of the spaceways, he traveled the space lines from Mars to Venus to the moons of Jupiter. No captain could refuse to carry Riesling and his battered guitar. He sang of all the wonders of the galaxy. But his greatest song was of the sight he would never see. The green hills of Earth. Tonight, Dimension X has presented... The Embassy, a story by Donald A. Walheim, as adapted for radio by George Leffords. Joseph Julian was heard as Broderick, Barry Kroger as Graphius. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Don Abbott. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Tomorrow, hear High Adventure. Now it's Truth or Consequences on NBC.